This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book the Third. The Track of a Storm. Chapter 7. A Knock at the Door. I have saved him. It was not another of the dreams in which he had often come back. He was really here. And yet his wife trembled, and a vague but heavy fear was upon her. All the air round was so thick and dark, the people were so passionately revengeful and fitful, the innocent were so constantly put to death on vague suspicion and black malice, it was so impossible to forget that many as blameless as her husband, and as dear to others as he was to her, every day shared the fate from which she had been clutched, that her heart could not be as lightened of its load as she felt it ought to be. The shadows of the wintry afternoon were beginning to fall, and even now the dreadful carts were rolling through the streets. Her mind pursued them, looking for him among the condemned, and then she clung closer to his real presence and trembled more. Her father, cheering her, showed a compassionate superiority to this woman's weakness, which was wonderful to see. No garret, no shoemaking, no one hundred and five North Tower now. He had accomplished the task he had set himself. His promise was redeemed. He had saved Charles. Let them all lean upon him. Their housekeeping was of a very frugal kind, not only because that was the safest way of life, involving the least offense to the people, but because they were not rich, and Charles, throughout his imprisonment, had had to pay heavily for his bad food, and for his guard, and towards the living of the poorer prisoners. Partly on this account, and partly to avoid a domestic spy, they kept no servant. The citizen and citizeness who acted as porters at the courtyard gate rendered them occasional service, and Jerry, almost wholly transferred to them by Mr. Lorry, had become their daily retainer, and had his bed there every night. It was an ordinance of the Republic, one and indivisible of liberty, equality, fraternity, or death, that on the door or doorpost of every house the name of every inmate must be legibly inscribed in letters of a certain size at a certain convenient height from the ground. Mr. Jerry Cruncher's name, therefore, duly embellished the doorpost down below. And, as the afternoon shadows deepened, the owner of that name himself appeared, from overlooking a painter whom Dr. Manette had employed to add to the list the name of Charles Evermond called Darnay. In the universal fear and distrust that darkened the time, all the usual harmless ways of life were changed. In the doctor's little household, as in very many others, the articles of daily consumption that were wanted were purchased every evening, in small quantities, and at various small shops. To avoid attracting notice and to give as little occasion as possible for talk and envy was the general desire. For some months past, Miss Pross and Mr. Cruncher had discharged the office of purveyors, the former carrying the money, the latter the basket. Every afternoon, at about the time when the public lamps were lighted, they fared forth on this duty, and made and brought home such purchases as were needful. Although Miss Pross, through her long association with the French family, might have known as much of their languages of her own, if she had had a mind, she had no mind in that direction. Consequently, she knew no more of that nonsense, as she was pleased to call it, than Mr. Cruncher did. So her manner of marketing was to plump a noun substantive at the head of the shopkeeper without any introduction in the nature of an article, and, if it happened not to be the name of the thing she wanted, to look round for that thing, lay hold of it, and hold on by it until the bargain was concluded. She always made a bargain for it by holding up, as a statement of its just price, one finger less than the merchant held up, whatever his number might be. "'Now, Mr. Cruncher,' said Miss Pross, whose eyes were red with felicity, "'if you are ready, I am.' Jerry hoarsely professed himself at Miss Pross's service. He had worn all his rust off long ago, but nothing would file his spiky head down. "'There's all manner of things wanted,' said Miss Pross, "'and we shall have a precious time of it. We want wine among the rest. Nice toast these redheads will be drinking wherever we buy it.' "'It will be much the same to your knowledge, miss, I should think,' retorted Jerry, "'whether they drink your health or the old uns.' "'Who's he?' said Miss Pross. Mr. Cruncher, with some diffidence, explained himself as meaning old Nick's. 
Ha! It doesn't need an interpreter to explain the meaning of these creatures. They have but one, and it's midnight murder and mischief. Hush, dear, pray, pray be cautious, cried Lucy. Yes, 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 I'll be cautious, but I may say among ourselves that I do hope there will be no oniony and tobacco-y smotherings in the form of embracings all around, going on in the streets. Now, Ladybird, never you stir from that fire till I come back. Take care of the dear husband you have recovered, and don't move your pretty head from his shoulder as you have it now, till you see me again. May I ask you a question, Dr. Manette, before I go? I think you may take that liberty, the doctor answered, smiling. For gracious sake, don't talk about liberty. We have quite enough of that, said Miss Pross. Hush, dear, again, Lucy remonstrated. Well, my sweet, said Miss Pross, nodding her head emphatically, the short and the long of it is that I am a subject of His Most Gracious Majesty King George the Third. Miss Pross curtsied at the name. And as such, my maxim is, confound their politics, frustrate their knavish tricks, on him our hopes we fix, God save the king. Mr. Cruncher, in an access of loyalty, growlingly repeated the words after Miss Pross, like somebody at church. I am glad you have so much of the Englishman in you, though I wish you had never taken that cold in your voice, said Miss Pross approvingly. But the question, Dr. Manette, is there, it was the good creature's way, to affect to make light of anything that was a great anxiety with them all, and to come at it in this chance manner. Is there any prospect yet of our getting out of this place? I fear not yet. It would be dangerous for Charles yet. Hey ho hum, said Miss Pross, cheerfully repressing a sigh as she glanced at her darling's golden hair in the light of the fire. Then we must have patience and wait, that's all. We must hold up our heads and fight low, as my brother Solomon used to say. Now, Mr. Cruncher, don't you move, Ladybird. They went out, leaving Lucy and her husband, her father, and the child, by a bright fire. Mr. Lorry was expected back presently from the banking-house. Miss Pross had lighted the lamp, but had put it aside in a corner that they might enjoy the firelight undisturbed. Little Lucy sat by her grandfather with her hands clasped through his arm, and he, in a tone not rising much above a whisper, began to tell her a story of a great and powerful fairy who had opened a prison wall and let out a captive who had once done the fairy a service. All was subdued and quiet, and Lucy was more at ease than she had been. "'What is that?' she cried all at once. "'My dear,' said her father, stopping in his story and laying his hand on hers, "'command yourself. What a disordered state you are in! The least thing, nothing, startles you. You, your father's daughter. I thought my father, said Lucy, excusing herself, with a pale face and in a faltering voice, that I heard strange feet upon the stair. My love, the staircase is as still as death. As he said the word, a blow was struck upon the door. Oh, father, father, what can this be? Hide, Charles, save him! My child, said the doctor, rising, and laying his hand up on her shoulder, I have saved him. What weakness is this, my dear? Let me go to the door. He took the lamp in his hand, crossed the two intervening outer rooms, and opened it. A rude clattering of feet over the floor, and four rough men in red caps, armed with sabres and pistols, entered the room. The citizen Evremond called Darnay, said the first. Who seeks him, answered Darnay. I seek him. We seek him. I know you, Evremond. I saw you before the tribunal today. You are again the prisoner of the Republic. The four surrounded him, where he stood with his wife and child clinging to him. Tell me how and why am I again a prisoner? It is enough that you return straight to the conciergerie, and will know to-morrow. You are summoned for to-morrow. Dr. Manette, whom this visitation had so turned into stone, that he stood with the lamp in his hand, as if be woe a statue made to hold it, moved after these words were spoken, put the lamp down, and confronting the speaker and taking him, not ungently, by the loose front of his red woolen shirt, said, You know him, you have said. Do you know me? Yes, I know you, Citizen Doctor. We all know you, Citizen Doctor, said the other three. He looked abstractedly from one to the other, and said in a lower voice after a pause, 
Will you answer his question to me, then? How does this happen? Citizen doctor, said the first reluctantly, he has been denounced to the section of Saint Antoine. This citizen, pointing out the second who had entered, is from Saint Antoine. The citizen here indicated, nodded his head, and added, He is accused by Saint Antoine. Of what? asked the doctor. Citizen doctor, said the first with his former reluctance, ask no more. If the Republic demands sacrifices from you, without doubt you as good patriot will be happy to make them. The Republic goes before all. The people is supreme. Evermond, we are pressed. One word, the doctor entreated. Will you tell me who denounced him? It is against rule, answered the first, but you can ask him of Saint Antoine here. The doctor turned his eyes upon that man, who moved uneasily on his feet, rubbed his beard a little, and at length said, Well, truly it is against rule, but he is denounced, and gravely, by the citizen and citizeness de Farge, and by one other. What other? Do you ask, citizen doctor? Yes. Then, said he of St. Antoine, with a strange look, you will be answered to-morrow. Now I am dumb. End of Chapter 7, A Knock at the Door, Book the Third, The Track of a Storm. Read by Tora in Yellowstone National Park, October 2006. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Minter A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens Book Three, Chapter Eight A Hand at Cards Happily unconscious of the new calamity at home, Miss Pross threaded her way along the narrow streets and crossed the river by the bridge of the Pont Neuf, reckoning in her mind the number of indispensable purchases she had to make. Mr. Cruncher, with the basket, walked at her side. They both looked to the right and to the left into most of the shops they passed, had a wary eye for all gregarious assemblages of people, and turned out of their road to avoid any very excited group of talkers. It was a raw evening, and the misty river, blurred to the eye with blazing lights, and to the ear with harsh noises, showed where the barges were stationed, in which the smiths worked, making guns for the army of the Republic. Woe to the man who played tricks with that army, or got undeserved promotion in it. Better for him that his beard had never grown, for the national razor shaved him close. Having purchased a few small articles of grocery, and a measure of oil for the lamp, Miss Pross bethought herself of the wine they wanted. After peeping into several wine-shops, she stopped at the sign of the good Republican Brutus of Antiquity, not far from the National Palace, once, and twice, the Tuileries, where the aspect of things rather took their fancy. It had a quieter look than any other place of the same description they had passed, and though red with patriotic caps, was not so red as the rest. Sounding Mr. Cruncher, and finding him of her opinion, Miss Pross resorted to the good Republican Brutus of Antiquity, attended by her cavalier. Slightly observant of the smoky lights, of the people, pipe in mouth, playing with limp cards and yellow dominoes, of the one bare-breasted, bare-armed, soot-begrimed workman reading a journal aloud, and of the others listening to him, of the weapons worn or laid aside to be resumed, of the two or three customers fallen forward asleep, who in the popular high-shouldered shaggy black spencer looked in that attitude like slumbering bears or dogs, and the two outlandish customers approached the counter, and showed what they wanted. As their wine was measuring out, a man parted from another man in a corner, and rose to depart. In going he had to face Miss Pross. No sooner did he face her, than Miss Pross uttered a scream, and clapped her hands. In a moment the whole company was on their feet, 
that somebody was assassinated by somebody vindicating a difference of opinion was the likeliest occurrence. Everybody looked to see somebody fall, but only saw a man and woman standing staring at each other, the man with all the outward aspect of a Frenchman and a thorough Republican, the woman evidently English. What was said in this disappointing anticlimax by the disciples of the good Republican Brutus of antiquity, except that it was something very voluble and loud, would have been as so much Hebrew or Chaldean to Miss Pross and her protector, though they had been all ears. But they had no ears for anything in their surprise, for it must be recorded that not only was Miss Pross lost in amazement and agitation, but Mr. Cruncher, though it seemed on his own separate and individual account, was in a state of the greatest wonder. "'What is the matter?' said the man, who had caused Miss Pross to scream, speaking in a vexed, abrupt voice, though in a low tone and in English. "'Oh, Solomon, Solomon!' cried Miss Pross, clapping her hands again. "'After not setting eyes upon you or hearing of you for so long a time, do I find you here?' "'Don't call me Solomon. Do you want to be the death of me?' asked the man, in a furtive, frightened way. "'Brother, brother!' cried Miss Pross, bursting into tears. "'Have I ever been so hard with you that you ask me such a cruel question?' "'Then hold your meddlesome tongue,' said Solomon. "'And come out, if you want to speak to me. Pay for your wine and come out. Who's this man?' Miss Pross, shaking her loving and dejected head at her by no means affectionate brother, said through her tears, "'Mr. Cruncher!' "'Let him come out, too,' said Solomon. "'Does he think me a ghost?' "'Apparently Mr. Cruncher did, to judge from his looks. "'He said not a word, however, "'and Miss Pross, exploring the depths of her reticule "'through her tears with great difficulty, paid for the wine. "'As she did so, Solomon turned to the followers "'of the good Republican Brutus of Antiquity, "'and offered a few words of explanation in the French language, "'which caused them all to relapse into their former places and pursuits. "'Now,' said Solomon, stopping at the dark street corner. "'What do you want?' "'How dreadfully unkind in a brother nothing has ever turned my love away from,' cried Miss Pross, "'to give me such a greeting and show me no affection.' "'There, confound it, there,' said Solomon, making a dab at Miss Pross's lips with his own. "'Now, are you content?' Miss Pross only shook her head and wept in silence. "'If you expect me to be surprised,' said her brother Solomon, "'I am not surprised. I knew you were here. I know of most people who are here. "'If you really don't want to endanger my existence, which I half believe you do, "'go your ways as soon as possible, and let me go mine. I am busy. I am an official.' "'My English brother Solomon,' mourned Miss Pross, casting up her tear-fraught eyes, "'that had the makings in him of one of the best and greatest men in his native country, "'an official among foreigners, and such foreigners.' "'I would almost sooner have seen the dear boy lying in his—' "'I said so,' cried her brother, interrupting. "'I knew it. You want to be the death of me. I shall be rendered suspected by my own sister, just as I am getting on.' "'The gracious and merciful heavens forbid!' cried Miss Pross. "'Far rather would I never see you again, dear Solomon, though I have ever loved you truly, and ever shall. Say but one affectionate word to me, and tell me there is nothing angry or estranged between us, and I will detain you no longer.' "'Good Miss Pross, as if the estrangement between them had come of any culpability of hers, as if Mr. Lorry had not known it for a fact, years ago, in the quiet corner in Soho, that this precious brother had spent her money and left her.' He was saying the affectionate word, however, with a far more grudging condescension and patronage than he could have shown if their relative merits and positions had been reversed, which is invariably the case all the world over, when Mr. Cruncher, touching him on the shoulder, hoarsely and unexpectedly, interposed with the following singular question. "'Ah, say, might I ask the favour, as to whether your name is John Solomon, or Solomon John?' The official turned towards him with sudden distrust. He had not previously uttered a word. "'Come,' said Mr. Cruncher, "'speak out, you know,' which, by the way, was more than he could do himself. "'John Solomon? or oh, Solomon John. She calls you Solomon, and she must know, being your sister. And I know you're John, you know. Which of the two goes first? 
"'And regarding that name Frost, likewise. "'That weren't your name over the water.' "'What do you mean?' "'Well, I don't know all I mean, "'cause I can't call to mind what your name was over the water.' "'No?' "'No, but I swear it was a name of two syllables.' "'Indeed. "'Yeah, t'other one was one syllable. "'I know you. "'You was a spy witness at the Bailey. "'Why, well, in the name of the father of lies, own father to yourself, "'was you called at that time?' "'Bossad,' said another voice, striking in. "'That's the name for a thousand pound,' cried Jerry. "'The speaker who struck in was Sidney Carton. "'He had his hands behind him, under the skirts of his riding-coat, "'and he stood at Mr. Cruncher's elbow "'as negligently as he might have stood at the old bailey itself. "'Don't be alarmed, my dear Miss Pross. "'I arrived at Mr. Lorry's to his surprise yesterday evening. "'We agreed that I would not present myself elsewhere "'until all was well, or until I could be useful. "'I present myself here to beg a little talk with your brother. "'I wish you had a better employed brother than Mr. Barsad.' "'I wish for your sake, Mr. Barsad, was not a sheep of the prisons.' "'Sheep was a cant-word at the time, for a spy under the jailers. "'The spy, who was pale, turned paler, and asked him how he dared. "'I'll tell you,' said Sidney. "'I lighted on you, Mr. Barsad, coming out of the prison of the conciergerie, "'while I was contemplating the walls an hour or more ago. "'You have a face to be remembered, and I remember faces well.' "'made curious by seeing you in that connection, "'and having a reason to which you are no stranger "'for associating you with the misfortunes of a friend, "'now very unfortunate, "'I walked in your direction. "'I walked into the wine-shop here, "'close after you, and sat near you. "'I had no difficulty in deducing from your unreserved conversation, "'and the rumour openly going about among your admirers, "'the nature of your calling.' and gradually what I had done at random seemed to shape itself into a purpose, Mr. Barr said. "'What purpose?' the spy asked. "'It would be troublesome, and might be dangerous to explain it in the street. Could you favour me, in confidence, with some minutes of your company, at the office of Telson's Bank, for instance?' "'Under a threat?' "'Oh, did I say that?' "'Then why should I go there?' "'Really, Mr. Barsad, I can't say, if you can't.' "'Do you mean that you won't say, sir?' the spy irresolutely asked. "'You apprehend me very clearly, Mr. Barsad. I won't.' Carton's negligent recklessness of manner came powerfully in aid of his quickness and skill in such a business as he had in his secret mind, and with such a man as he had to do with. His practised eye saw it, and made the most of it. "'Now, I told you so,' said the spy, casting a reproachful look at his sister. "'If any trouble comes of this, it's your doing.' "'Come, come, Mr. Barsad,' exclaimed Sidney. "'Don't be ungrateful. But for my great respect for your sister, I might not have led up so pleasantly to a little proposal that I wish to make for our mutual satisfaction. Do you go with me to the bank?' "'I'll hear what you've got to say. Yes, I'll go with you. "'I propose that we first conduct your sister safely to the corner of her own street. "'Let me take your arm, Miss Pross. "'This is not a good city at this time for you to be out unprotected, "'and as your escort knows, Mr. Barsad, I will invite him to Mr. Lorry's with us. "'Are we ready? Come, then.' "'Miss Pross recalled soon afterwards, and to the end of her life remembered.' that as she pressed her hands on Sidney's arm, and looked up in his face, imploring him to do no hurt to Solomon, there was a braced purpose in the arm, and a kind of inspiration in the eyes, which not only contradicted his light manner, but changed and raised the man. She was too much occupied then with fears for the brother who so little deserved her affection, and with Sidney's friendly reassurances adequately to heed what she observed. They left her at the corner of the street, and Carton led the way to Mr. Lorry's, which was within a few minutes' walk. John Barsad, or Solomon Pross, walked at his side. Mr. Lorry had just finished his dinner, and was sitting before a cheery little log or two of fire. 
perhaps looking into their blaze for the picture of that younger elderly gentleman from Telson's, who had looked into the red coals at the Royal George at Dover, now a good many years ago. He turned his head as they entered, and showed the surprise with which he saw a stranger. "'Miss Pross's brother, sir,' said Sidney. "'Mr. Barsad.' "'Barsad?' repeated the old gentleman. "'Barsad? I have an association with the name and with the face.' "'I told you you had a remarkable face, Mr. Barsad,' observed Carton coolly. "'Pray sit down.' As he took a chair himself, he supplied the link that Mr. Lorry wanted, by saying to him, with a frown, "'Witness at that trial.' Mr. Lorry immediately remembered, and regarded his new visitor with an undisguised look of abhorrence. "'Mr. Barsad has been recognised by Miss Pross.' "'as the affectionate brother you have heard of,' said Sidney, "'and has acknowledged the relationship. "'I passed a worse news. "'Darnay has been arrested again.' "'Struck with consternation, the old gentleman exclaimed, "'What do you tell me? "'I left him safe and free within these two hours, "'and am about to return to him.' "'Arrested for all that. "'When was it done, Mr. Barsad?' "'Just now, if at all.' "'Mr. Barsad is the best authority possible, sir,' said Sidney, "'and I have it from Mr. Barsad's communication to a friend and brother sheep, over a bottle of wine, that the arrest has taken place. He left the messengers at the gate and saw them admitted by the porter. There is no earthly doubt that he is retaken. Mr. Lorry's business eye read in the speaker's face that it was loss of time to dwell upon the point. Confused but sensible that something might depend on his presence of mind, he commanded himself, and was silently attentive. "'Now I trust,' said Sidney to him, "'that the name and influence of Dr. Manette may stand him in as good stead to-morrow. You said it would be before the tribunal again to-morrow, Mr. Barsad?' "'Yes, I believe so. In as good stead to-morrow as to-day. But it may not be so. I own to you I am shaken, Mr. Lorry, by Dr. Manette's not having had the power to prevent this arrest.' "'He may not have known of it beforehand,' said Mr. Lorry. "'But that very circumstance would be alarming, "'when we remember how identified he is with his son-in-law.' "'That's true,' Mr. Lorry acknowledged, "'with his troubled hand at his chin, "'and his troubled eyes on Carton. "'In short,' said Sidney, "'this is a desperate time, "'when desperate games are played for desperate stakes. "'Let the doctor play the winning game.' I will play the losing one. No man's life here is worth purchase. Any one carried home by the people to-day may be condemned to-morrow. Now, the stake I have resolved to play for, in case of the worst, is a friend in the conciergerie, and the friend I purpose to myself to win is Mr. Barsad. You need to have good cards, sir, said the spy. I'll run them over. "'I'll see what I hold. Mr. Lorry, you know what a brute I am. I wish you'd give me a little brandy.' It was put before him, and he drank off a glassful, drank off another glassful, pushed the bottle thoughtfully away. "'Mr. Barsad,' he went on, in the tone of one who really was looking over her hand at cards, "'sheep of the prisons, emissary of the Republican committees, now turnkey, now prisoner,' always spy and secret informer, so much the more valuable here for being English that an Englishman is less open to suspicion of subordination in these characters than a Frenchman, represents himself to his employers under a false name. That's a very good card. Mr. Barsad, now in the employ of the Republican French government, was formerly in the employ of the aristocratic English government, the enemy of France and freedom. "'That's an excellent card. "'Inference clear as day in this region of suspicion, "'that Mr. Barsad, still in the pay of the aristocratic English government, "'is the spy of Pitt, the treacherous foe of the Republic crouching in its bosom, "'the English traitor and agent of all mischief, so much spoken of and so difficult to find. "'That's a card not to be beaten. "'Have you followed my hand, Mr. Barsad?' "'Not to understand your play,' returned the spy, somewhat uneasily. "'I play my ace. 
Denunciation of Mr. Barsad to the nearest section committee. Look over your hand, Mr. Barsad, and see what you have. Don't hurry. He drew the bottle near, poured out another glassful of brandy, and drank it off. He saw that the spy was fearful of him drinking himself into a fit state for the immediate denunciation of him. Seeing it, he poured out and drank another glassful. "'Look over your hand carefully, Mr. Barsad. Take time.' It was a poorer hand than he suspected. Mr. Barsad saw losing cards in it that Sidney Carton knew nothing of. Thrown out of his honourable employment in England, through too much unsuccessful hard swearing there, not because he was not wanted there, our English reasons for vaunting our superiority to secrecy and spies were of very modern date. He knew that he had crossed the Channel, and accepted service in France, first as a tempter and an eavesdropper among his own countrymen there, gradually as a tempter and an eavesdropper among the natives. He knew that under the overthrown government he had been a spy upon St. Antoine and Defarge's wine-shop, had received from the watchful police such heads of information concerning Dr. Manette's imprisonment, release, and history, as should serve him for an introduction to familiar conversation with the Defarges, and tried them on Madame Defarge, and had broken down with them signally. He always remembered with fear and trembling that that terrible woman had knitted when he talked with her, and had looked ominously at him as her fingers moved. He had since seen her in the section of St. Antoine, over and over again produce her knitted registers, and denounce people whose lives the guillotine then surely swallowed up. He knew, as every one employed as he was did, that he was never safe, that flight was impossible, that he was tied fast under the shadow of the axe, and that in spite of his utmost turgivisation and treachery in furtherance of the reigning terror, a word might bring it down upon him once denounced and on such grave grounds as had just now been suggested to his mind, he foresaw that the dreadful woman, of whose unrelenting character he had seen many proofs, would produce against him that fatal register, and would quash his last chance of life. Besides that all secret men are men soon terrified, here were surely cards enough of one black suit to justify the holder in growing rather livid as he turned them over. "'You scarcely seem to like your hand,' said Sidney, with the greatest composure. "'Do you play?' "'I think, sir,' said the spy, in the meanest manner, as he turned to Mr. Lorry, "'I may appeal to a gentleman of your years and benevolence to put it to this other gentleman, so much your junior, whether he can under any circumstances reconcile it to his station to play that ace of which he has spoken.' I admit that I am a spy, and that it is considered a discreditable station, though it must be filled by somebody. But this gentleman is no spy, and why should he so demean himself as to make himself one? I play my ace, Mr. Barsad, said Carton, taking the answer on himself and looking at his watch, without any scruple, in a very few minutes. I should have hoped, gentlemen both, said the spy, always striving to hook Mr. Lorry into the discussion, that your respect for my sister— I could not better testify my respect for your sister than by finally relieving her of her brother, said Sidney Carton. You think not, sir? I have thoroughly made up my mind about it. The smooth manner of the spy— curiously in dissonance with his ostentatiously rough dress, and probably with his usual demeanour, received such a check from the inscrutability of Carton, who was a mystery to wiser and honester men than he, that it faltered here, and failed him. While he was at a loss, Carton said, resuming his former air of contemplating cards— "'And, indeed, now I think again, I have a strong impression that I have another good card here, not yet enumerated. That friend and fellow-sheep, who spoke of himself as pasturing in the country prisons, who was he?' "'French. You don't know him,' said the spy, quickly. "'French, eh?' repeated Carton, musing and not appearing to notice him at all, though he echoed his word. "'Well, he may be.' "'Is, I assure you,' said the spy, "'though it's not important.' 
"'Though it's not important,' repeated Carton, in the same mechanical way. "'Though it's not important. No, it's not important. No. Yet I know the face.' "'I think not. I'm sure not. It can't be,' said the spy. "'It can't be,' muttered Sidney Carton retrospectively, and filling his glass, which fortunately was a small one, again. "'Can't be. Spoke good French. Yet like a foreigner, I thought.' "'Provincial,' said the spy. "'No, foreign,' cried Carton, striking his open hand on the table, as a light broke clearly in his mind. "'Cly! Disguised, but the same man.' "'We had that man before us at the old Bailey.' "'Now, there you are hasty, sir,' said Barsad, with a smile that gave his aquiline nose an extra inclination to one side. "'There you really give me an advantage over you. Cly, who I will unreservedly admit at this distance of time, was a partner of mine, has been dead several years. I attended him in his last illness. He was buried in London, at the Church of St. Pancras in the Fields.' His unpopularity with the blackguard multitude at the moment prevented my following his remains, but I helped to lay him in his coffin. Here Mr. Lorry became aware, from where he sat, of a most remarkable goblin shadow on the wall. Tracing it to its source, he discovered it to be caused by a sudden extraordinary rising and stiffening of all the risen and stiff hair on Mr. Cruncher's head. "'Let us be reasonable,' said the spy, and, and let us be fair. "'To show you how mistaken you are, and what an unfounded assumption yours is, "'I will lay before you a certificate of Clyde's burial, "'which I happen to have carried in my pocket-book.' "'With a hurried hand he produced and opened it. "'Ever since. "'There it is. "'Oh, look at it, look at it. "'You may take it in your hand. "'It's no forgery.' "'Here Mr. Lorry perceived the reflection on the wall to Elongate, "'and Mr. Cruncher rose and stepped forward.' His hair could not have been more violently on end if it had been that moment dressed by the cow with the crumpled horn in the house that Jack built. Unseen by the spy, Mr. Cruncher stood at his side and touched him on the shoulder like a ghostly bailiff. "'That there Roger Cly, master,' said Mr. Cruncher, with a taciturn and iron-bound visage. "'So you put him in his coffin?' "'I did.' "'Who took him out of it?' Barsad leant back in his chair and stammered, "'What do you mean?' "'I mean,' said Mr. Cruncher, "'that he warn't never in it, no, not he. "'I'll have my head took off if he were ever in it.' The spy looked round at the two gentlemen. They both looked in unspeakable astonishment at Jerry. "'I'll tell you,' said Jerry, "'that you buried paving stones and earth in that there coffin.' "'Don't you go and tell me that you buried Cly. "'It was a taking. "'Me and two more knows it.' "'How do you know it?' "'What's that to you, Ecod?' growled Mr. Cruncher. "'It's you I've got a old grudge against, is it, "'with your shameful impositions upon tradesmen? "'Or catch hold of your throat and choke you for half a guinea?' "'Sidney Carton, who, with Mr. Lorry, "'had been lost in amazement at this turn of the business.' here requested Mr. Cruncher to moderate and explain himself. "'Another time, sir,' he returned evasively. "'The present time is ill-convenient for explaining. "'What I stand to is that he knows full well "'what that there claw was never in that there coffin. "'Let him say he was in so much of a word of one syllable "'and I'll either catch hold of his throat and choke him for half a guinea.' Mr. Cruncher dwelt upon this as quite a liberal offer. "'Or I'll out and announce him.' Um, I see one thing, said Carton. I hold another card, Mr. Barsad. Impossible here in raging Paris, with suspicion filling the air, for you to outlive denunciation when you are in communication with another aristocratic spy of the same antecedents as yourself, who, moreover, has the mystery about him of having feigned death and come to life again. A plot in the prisons of the foreigner against the Republic? A strong card. "'A certain guillotine card. "'Do you play?' "'No,' returned the spy. "'I throw up. "'I confess that we were so unpopular with the outrageous mob. "'I only got away from England at the risk of being ducked to death. 
and that Clive was so ferreted up and down that he never would have got away at all but for that sham. Now how this man knows it was a sham is a wonder of wonders to me. "'Never you trouble your head about this man,' retorted the contentious Mr. Cruncher. "'You'll have trouble enough with giving your attention to that gentleman. And look here. Once more.' Mr. Cruncher could not be restrained from making rather an ostentatious parade of his liberality. "'I'd catch hold of your throat and choke you for half a guinea.' The sheep of the prisons turned from him to Sidney Carton, and said with more decision, "'It has come to a point. I go on duty soon, and can't overstay my time. You've told me you had a proposal. What is it? Now, it's no use asking too much of me. Ask me to do anything in my office, putting my head in great extra danger, and I had better trust my life to the chances of a refusal than the chances of consent. In short, I should make that choice. You talk of desperation. We're all desperate here. Remember, I may denounce you, if I think proper.' "'and I can swear my way through stone walls, and so can others. "'Now, what do you want with me?' "'Not very much. "'You're a turnkey at the conciergerie. "'I tell you, once and for all, there is no such thing as an escape possible,' said the spy firmly. "'Why need you tell me what I have not asked? "'You are a turnkey at the conciergerie. "'I am, sometimes. "'You can be, when you choose.' "'I can pass in and out when I choose.' Sidney Carton filled another glass with brandy, poured it slowly out upon the hearth, and watched it as it dropped. It being all spent, he said, rising, "'So far we have spoken before these two, because it was as well that the merits of the card should not rest solely between you and me. Come into the dark room here, and let us have one final word, alone.' End of Book 3, Chapter 8This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens Book 3, The Track of a Storm Chapter 9, The Game Made while Sidney Carton and the sheep of the prisons were in the adjoining dark room, speaking so low that not a sound was heard, Mr. Lorry looked at Jerry in considerable doubt and mistrust. That honest tradesman's manner of receiving the look did not inspire confidence. He changed the leg on which he rested as often as if he had fifty of those limbs, and were trying them all. He examined his fingernails with a very questionable closeness of attention, and whenever Mr. Lorry's eyes caught his, he was taken with that peculiar kind of short cough requiring the hollow of a hand before it, which is seldom, if ever, known to be an infirmity attendant on perfect openness of character. Jerry, said Mr. Lorry, come here. Mr. Cruncher came forward sideways, with one of his shoulders in advance of him. What have you been besides a messenger? After some cogitation, accompanied with an intent look at his patron, Mr. Cruncher conceived the luminous idea of replying, "'Agricultural character.' "'My mind misgives me much,' said Mr. Lorry, angrily shaking a forefinger at him, "'that you have used the respectable and great house of Telson's as a blind, and that you have had an unlawful occupation of an infamous description. If you have, don't expect me to befriend you when you get back to England. If you have, don't expect me to keep your secret. Telson shall not be imposed upon. I hope, sir, pleaded the abashed Mr. Cruncher, that a gentleman like yourself, what I had the honor of odd jobbing till I'm gray at it, would think twice about harming of me, even if it was so. I don't say it is, but even if it was. And which it is to be took into account that, if it was, it wouldn't, even then, be all on one side. There'd be two sides to it. There might be medical doctors at the present hour, a picking up their guineas, where an honest tradesman don't pick up his fardens. Fardens, no, nor yet his half fardens. Half fardens, no, nor yet his quarter. A banking away like smoke at Tulson's, and a cocking their medical eyes at that tradesman on the sly, a going in and going out to their own carriages. Ah, equally like smoke, if not more so. Well, that'd be imposing, too, on Telson's, for you cannot sarce the goose and not the gander. And here's Mrs. Cruncher, 
or leastways was in the old England times, and would be to-morrow, if cause given, a floppin' again the business to that degree as is ruinating, stark ruinating, whereas them medical doctors' wives don't flop, catch em at it, or if they flop, their toppings go in favor of more patients, and how can you rightly have one without t'other? Well, what with undertakers, and what with parish clerks, and what with sextons, and what with private watchmen, all the warishness and all in it, a man wouldn't get much by it, even if it was so. And what little a man did get would never prosper with him, Mr. Lorry. He'd never have no good of it. He'd want all along to be out of the line if he could see his way out, being once in, even if it was so. Ugh! cried Mr. Lorry, rather relenting nevertheless. I am shocked at the sight of you. Now, what I would humbly offer to you, sir, pursued Mr. Cruncher, even if it was so, which I don't say it is, "'Don't prevaricate,' said Mr. Lorry. "'No, I will not, sir,' returned Mr. Crunchers, as if nothing were further from his thoughts or practice. "'Which I don't say it is. What I would humbly offer to you, sir, would be this. Upon that there stool, at that there bar, sets that there boy of mine, brought up and growed up to be a man, what will errand you, messenger you, general light job you, till your heels is where your head is, if such should be your wishes.' If it was so, which I don't say it is, for I will not prevaricate to you, sir, let that there boy keep his father's place, and take care of his mother. Don't blow upon that boy's father. Do not do it, sir, and let that father go into the line of the regular diggin', and make amends for what he would have undug, if it was so, by diggin' of him in with a will, and with convictions respecting the future keepin' of him safe. That, Mr. Lorry said Mr. Cruncher, wiping his forehead with his arm, as an announcement that he had arrived at the peroration of his discourse, is what I would respectfully offer to you, sir. A man don't see all this here a-going on dreadful round him, in the way of subjects without heads, dear me, plentiful enough for him to bring the price down to porterage, and hardly that, without having his serious thoughts of things. And these here would be mine, if it was so, in treating of you for to bear in mind that what I just said now, up and I said in the good cause where I might have kept it back. That at least is true, said Mr. Lorry. Say no more now. It may be that I shall yet stand your friend, if you deserve it, and repent in action, not words. I want no more words. Mr. Cruncher knuckled his forehead as Sidney Carton and the spy returned from the dark room. Adieu, Mr. Bersad, said the former. Our arrangement thus made, you have nothing to fear from me. He sat down in a chair on the hearth, over against Mr. Lorry. When they were alone, Mr. Lorry asked him what he had done. Not much. If it should go ill with the prisoner, I have ensured access to him once. Mr. Lorry's countenance fell. It is all I could do, said Carton. To propose too much would be to put this man's head under the axe, and, as he himself said, nothing worse could happen to him if he were denounced. It was obviously the weakness of the position. There is no help for it. But access to him, said Mr. Lorry, if it should go ill before the tribunal, will not save him. I never said it would. Mr. Lorry's eyes gradually sought the fire. His sympathy with his darling and the heavy disappointment of his second arrest gradually weakened them. He was an old man now, overborne with anxiety of late, and his tears fell. You are a good man and a true friend, said Carton, in an altered voice. Forgive me if I notice that you are affected. I could not see my father weep and sit by careless, and I could not respect your sorrow more if you were my father. You are free from that misfortune, however." Though he said the last words with a slip into his usual manner, there was a true feeling and respect both in his tone and in his touch that Mr. Lorry, who had never seen the better side of him, was wholly unprepared for. He gave him his hand, and Carton gently pressed it. "'To return to poor Darnay,' said Carton. Don't tell her of this interview or this arrangement. It would not enable her to go to see him. She might think it was contrived, in case of the worst, to convey him the means of anticipating the sentence. Mr. Lorry had not thought of that, and he looked quickly at Carton to see if it were in his mind. It seemed to be, for he turned the look and evidently understood it. She might think a thousand things, said Carton, and any of them would only add to her trouble. Don't speak to me of her. As I said to you when I first came, I had better not see her. I can put my hand out to do any little helpful work for her that my hand can find to do without that. You are going to her, I hope? She must be very desolate tonight. I am going now directly. 
I'm glad of that. She has such a strong attachment to you and reliance on you. How does she look? Anxious and unhappy, but very beautiful. Ah! Uh, it was a long, grieving sound, like a sigh, almost a sob. It attracted Mr. Lorry's eyes to Carton's face, which was turned to the fire. A light, or a shade, the old gentleman could not have said which, passed from it as swiftly as a change will sweep over the side hill on a wild, bright day, and he lifted his foot to put back one of those little flaming logs which was tumbling forward. He wore the white riding coat and top boots then in vogue, and the light of the fire touching their light surfaces made them look very pale, with his long brown hair all untrimmed hanging loose about him. His indifference to fire was sufficiently remarkable to elicit a word of remonstrance from Mr. Lorry. His boot was still upon the hot embers of the flaming log, when it had broken under the weight of his foot. "'I had forgot it,' he said. Mr. Lorry's eyes were again attracted to his face. Taking note of the wasted air which clouded the naturally handsome features, and having the expression of prisoners' faces fresh in his mind, he was strongly reminded of that expression. "'And your duties here have drawn to an end, sir?' said Carton, turning to him. "'Yes. As I was telling you last night when Lucy came in so unexpectedly, I have at length done all that I can do here. I hope to have left them in perfect safety, and then to have quitted Paris. I have my leave to pass. I was ready to go.' They were both silent. "'Yours is a long life to look back upon, sir,' said Carton, wistfully. "'I am in my seventy-eighth year.' You have been useful all your life, steadily and constantly occupied, trusted, respected, and looked up to. I have been a man of business ever since I have been a man. Indeed, I may say that I was a man of business when I was a boy. See what a place you fill at seventy-eight. How many people will miss you when you leave it empty? A solitary old bachelor, answered Mr. Lorry, shaking his head. There is nobody to weep for me. How can you say that? Wouldn't she weep for you? Wouldn't her child? Yes, yes, thank God. I didn't quite mean what I said. It is a thing to thank God for, is it not? Surely, surely. If you could say with truth to your own solitary heart tonight, I have secured to myself the love and attachment, the gratitude or respect of no human creature. I have won myself a tender place in no regard. I have done nothing good or serviceable to be remembered by. Your seventy-eight years would be seventy-eight heavy curses, would they not? You say truly, Mr. Carton. I think they would be. Sidney turned his eyes again upon the fire, and after a silence of a few moments said, I should like to ask you, does your childhood seem far off? Do the days when you sat at your mother's knee seem days of very long ago? Responding to his softened manner, Mr. Lorry answered, Twenty years back, yes. At this time of my life, no. For as I draw closer and closer to the end, I travel in the circle, nearer and nearer to the beginning. It seems to be one of the kind smoothings and preparings of the way. My heart is touched now by many remembrances that had long fallen asleep, of my pretty young mother and I so old and by many associations of the days when what we call the world was not so real with me, and my faults were not confirmed in me. "'I understand the feeling!' exclaimed Carton, with a bright flush. "'And are you the better for it?' "'I hope so.' Carton terminated the conversation here by rising to help him on with his outer coat. "'But you,' said Mr. Lorry, reverting to the theme, "'you are young.' Yes, said Carton, I am not old, but my young way was never the way to age. Enough of me. And of me, I am sure, said Mr. Lorry. Are you going out? I'll walk with you to her gate. You know my vagabond and restless habits. If I should prowl about the streets a long time, don't be uneasy. I shall reappear in the morning. You go to the court tomorrow? Yes, unhappily. I shall be there, but only as one of the crowd. My spy will find a place for me. Take my arm, sir. Mr. Lorry did so, and they went downstairs and out into the streets. A few minutes brought them to Mr. Lorry's destination. Carton left him there, but lingered at a little distance, and turned back to the gate again when it was shut and touched it. He had heard of her going to the prison every day. She came out here, he said, looking about him, turned this way, 
must have trod on these stones often. Let me follow in her steps. It was ten o'clock at night when he stood before the prison of La Force, where she had stood hundreds of times. A little wood sawyer, having closed his shop, was smoking his pipe at the shop door. "'Good night, citizen,' said Sidney Carton, pausing and going by, for the man eyed him inquisitively. "'Good night, citizen. How goes the Republic?' "'You mean the guillotine. Not ill. Sixty-three to-day. We shall mount to a hundred soon. Samson and his men complain sometimes of being exhausted. Ha, ha, ha! He is so droll, that Samson, such a barber. Do you often go to see him? Shave? Always, every day. What a barber! You have seen him at work? Never. Go and see him when he has a good batch. Figure this to yourself, citizen. He shaved the sixty-three to-day, in less than two pipes. Less than two pipes! Word of honor! As the grinning little man held out the pipe he was smoking, to explain how he timed the executioner, Carton was so sensible of a rising desire to strike the life out of him, that he turned away. "'But you are not English,' said the wood sawyer, "'though you wear English dress.' "'Yes,' said Carton, pausing again and answering over his shoulder. "'You speak like an old Frenchman. I am an old student here.' "'Aha! A perfect Frenchman! Good night, Englishman!' "'Good night, citizen.' "'But go and see that droll dog,' the little man persisted, calling after him, "'and take a pipe with you.' Sidney had not gone far out of sight when he stopped in the middle of the street under a glimmering lamp and wrote with his pencil on a scrap of paper. Then, traversing with the decided step of one who remembered the way well, several dark and dirty streets, much dirtier than usual, for the best public thoroughfares remained uncleansed in those times of terror, he stopped at his chemist's shop, which the owner was closing with his own hands. A small, dim, crooked shop, kept in torturous uphill thoroughfare, by a small, dim, crooked man. Giving this citizen two good night, as he confronted him at his counter, he laid the scrap of paper before him. Whew! the chemist whistled softly as he read it. Hi, hi, hi! Sidney Carton took no heed, and the chemist said, for you, citizen? For me. You will be careful to keep them separate, citizen. You know the consequences of mixing them? Perfectly. Certain small packets were made and given to him. He put them one by one in the breast of his inner coat, counted out the money for them, and deliberately left the shop. There is nothing more to do, said he, glancing upwards at the moon, until tomorrow. I can't sleep. It was not a reckless manner, the manner in which he said these words aloud under the fast-sailing clouds, nor was it more expressive of negligence than defiance. It was the settled manner of a tired man, who had wandered and struggled and got lost, but who at length struck into his road and saw its end. Long ago, when he had been famous among his early editors as a youth of great promise, he had followed his father to the grave. His mother had died years before. These solemn words, which had been read at his father's grave, arose in his mind as he went down the dark streets, among the heavy shadows, with the moon and the clouds sailing on high above him. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. In a city dominated by the axe, alone at night, with natural sorrow rising in him for the sixty-three who had been that day put to death, and for tomorrow's victims then awaiting their doom in the prisons, and still of tomorrow's and tomorrow's the chain of association that brought the words home, like a rusty old ship's anchor from the deep, might have been easily found. He did not seek it, but repeated them and went on. With a solemn interest in the lighted windows where the people were going to rest, forgetful through a few calm hours of the horrors surrounding them, in the towers of the churches, where no prayers were said, for the popular revulsion had even travelled that length of self-destruction from years of priestly impostors, plunderers, and profligates, in the distant burial places reserved, as they rode upon the gates, for eternal sleep, in the abounding gales, and in the streets along which the sixties rolled to a death which had become so common and material. 
that no sorrowful story of a haunting spirit ever arose among the people out of all the working of the guillotine. With a solemn interest in the whole life and death of the city settling down to its short nightly pause in fury, Sidney Carton crossed the Seine again for the lighter streets. Few coaches were abroad, for riders and coaches were liable to be suspected, and gentility hid its head in red nightcaps, and put on heavy shoes, and trudged. But the theatres were all well filled, and the people poured cheerfully out as he passed, and went chatting home. At one of the theatre doors there was a little girl with a mother, looking for a way across the street through the mud. He carried the child over, and before the timid arm was loosed from his neck, asked her for a kiss. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Now that the streets were quiet, and the night wore on, the words were in the echoes of his feet, and were in the night air. Perfectly calm and steady, he sometimes repeated them to himself as he walked, but he always heard them. The night wore out, and, as he stood upon the bridge listening to the water as it splashed the river walls of the island of Paris, where the picturesque confusion of houses and cathedrals shone bright in the light of the moon, the day came coldly, looking like a dead face out of the sky. Then the night, with the moon and the stars, turned pale and died, and for a little while it seemed as if creation were delivered over to death's dominion. But the glorious sun rising seemed to strike those words, that burden of the night, straight and warm to his heart in its long bright rays. And looking along them, with reverently shaded eyes, a bridge of light appeared to span the air between him and the sun, while the river sparkled under it. The strong tide, so swift, so deep and certain, was like a congenial friend in the morning stillness. He walked by the stream, far from the houses, and in the light and warmth of the sun, fell asleep on the bank. When he awoke and was afoot again, he lingered there yet a little longer, watching an eddy that turned and turned, purposeless, until the stream absorbed it and carried it on to the sea. Like me. A trading boat, with a sail of softened color of a dead leaf, then glided into his view, floated by him and died away. As its silent track in the water disappeared, the prayer that had broken up out of his heart for merciful consideration of all his poor blindnesses and arrows ended in the words, I am the resurrection and the life. Mr. Lorry was already out when he got back, and it was easy to surmise where the old man was gone. Sidney Carton drank nothing but a little coffee, ate some bread, and having washed and changed to refresh himself, went out to the place of trial. The court was all a stir and a buzz when the black sheep, whom many fell away from in dread, pressed him into an obscure corner among the crowd. Mr. Lorry was there, and Dr. Manette was there. She was there, sitting beside her father. When her husband was brought in, she turned to look upon him, so sustaining, so encouraging, so full of admiring love and pitying tenderness, yet so courageous for his sake that it called the healthy blood into his face, brightened his glance, and animated his heart. If there had been any eyes to notice the influence of her look on Sidney Carton, it would have been seen to be the same influence exactly. Before that unjust tribunal there was little or no order of procedure, ensuring to any accused person any reasonable hearing. There could have been no such revolution if all laws, forms, and ceremonies had not first been so monstrously abused that the suicidal vengeance of the revolution was to scatter them all to the winds. Every eye was turned to the jury. The same determined patriots and good republicans as yesterday and the day before and tomorrow and the day after. Eager and prominent among them, one man with a craving face, his fingers perpetually hovering about his lips, whose appearance gave great satisfaction to the spectators. A life-thirsting, cannibal-looking, bloody-minded juryman, the Jacques Three of Saint Antoine, the whole jury, as a jury of dogs, epinamel to try the deer. Every eye then turned to the five judges and the public prosecutor. No favorable leaning in that quarter today. 
a fell, uncompromising, murderous business meaning there. Every eye then sought some other eye in the crowd, and gleamed at it approvingly, and heads nodded at one another, before bending forward with a strained attention. Charles Evermond called Darnay, released yesterday, reaccused and retaken yesterday, indictment delivered to him last night, suspected and denounced enemy of the Republic, aristocrat, one of a family of tyrants, one of a race proscribed, for that they had used their abolished privileges to the infamous oppression of the people. Charles Evermond called Darnay, in right of such proscription, absolutely dead in law. To this effect, in as few or fewer words, the public prosecutor. The President asked, was the accused openly denounced or secretly? Openly, President. By whom? Three voices. Ernest Defarge, wine vendor of Saint Antoine. Good. Therese Defarge, his wife. Good. Alexandre Manette, physician. An uproar took place in the court, and in the midst of it, Dr. Manette was seen, pale and trembling, standing where he had been seated. President, I indignantly protest to you that this is a forgery and a fraud. You know the accused to be the husband of my daughter. My daughter, and those dear to her, are far dearer to me than my life. Who and where is the false conspirator who says that I denounce the husband of my child? Citizen Manette, be tranquil. To fail in submission to the authority of the tribunal would be to put yourself out of law. As to what is dearer to you than life, nothing can be so dear to a good citizen as the Republic. Loud acclamations hailed this rebuke. The President rang his bell, and with warmth resumed. If the Republic should demand of you the sacrifice of your child herself, you would have no duty but to sacrifice her. Listen to what is to follow. In the meantime, be silent. Frantic acclamations were again raised. Dr. Manette sat down, with his eyes looking around and his lips trembling. His daughter drew closer to him. The craving man on the jury rubbed his hands together and restored the usual hand to his mouth. Defarge was produced, when the court was quiet enough to admit of his being heard, and rapidly expounded the story of the imprisonment, and of his having been a mere boy in the doctor's service, and of the release, and of the state of the prisoner when released and delivered to him. This short examination followed, for the court was quick with its work. You did good service at the taking of the Bastille, citizen? I believe so. Here an excited woman screeched from the crowd. You were one of the best patriots there. Why not say so? You were a cannoneer that day there, and you were among the first to enter the accursed fortress when it fell. Patriots, I speak the truth. It was the vengeance who, amidst the warm commendations of the audience, thus assisted the proceedings. The president rang his bell, but... The vengeance, warming with encouragement, shrieked, I defy that bell, wherein she was likewise much commended. Inform the tribunal of what you did that day within the Bastille, citizen. I knew, said Defarge, looking down at his wife, who stood at the bottom of the steps on which he was raised, looking steadily up at him, I knew that this prisoner, of whom I speak, had been confined in a cell known as 105 North Tower. I knew it from himself. He knew himself by no other name than 105 North Tower, when he made shoes under my care. And I served my gun that day, I resolve, when the place shall fall, to examine that cell. It falls. I mount to the cell with a fellow citizen who is one of the jury directed by a gaoler. I examined it very closely. In a hole in the chimney, where a stone had been worked out and replaced, I find a written paper. This is that written paper. I have made it my business to examine some specimens of the writing of Dr. Manette. This is the writing of Dr. Manette. I confide this paper in the writing of Dr. Manette to the hands of the President. Let it be read. In a dead silence and stillness, the prisoner under trial looking lovingly at his wife, his wife only looking from him to look with solicitude at her father, Dr. Manette keeping his eyes fixed on the reader, Madame Defarge never taking hers from the prisoner, Defarge never taking his from his feasting wife, and all the other eyes were intent upon the doctor, who saw none of them. The paper was read as follows. 
End of Chapter 9, The Game Made, read by Tora in Campbellsburg, Kentucky, November 2006. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Sirwa. Michael.Sirwa, S I R O I S, dot com. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Three, Chapter Ten The Substance of the Shadow. I, Alexandre Manette, unfortunate physician, native of Beauvais, and afterwards resident in Paris, write this melancholy paper in my doleful cell in the Bastille, during the last month of the year, 1767. I write it at stolen intervals, under every difficulty. I design to secret it in the wall of the chimney, where I have slowly and laboriously made a place of concealment for it. Some pitying hand may find it there, when I and my sorrows are dust. These words are formed by the rusty iron point with which I write, with difficulty, in scrapings of soot and charcoal from the chimney, mixed with blood, in the last month of the tenth year of my captivity. Hope has quite departed from my breast. I know from terrible warnings I have noted in myself that my reason will not long remain unimpaired, but I solemnly declare that I am at this time in the possession of my right mind that is, my memory is exact and circumstantial, and that I write the truth, as I shall answer for these my last recorded words, whether they be ever read by men or not, at the eternal judgment seat. One cloudy moonlight night, in the third week of December, I think the twenty-second of the month, in the year 1757, I was walking on a retired part of the quay, by the Seine, for the refreshment of the frosty air, at an hour's distance from my place of residence, in the street of the School of Medicine, when a carriage came along behind me, driven very fast. As I stood aside to let that carriage pass, apprehensive that it might otherwise run me down, a head was put out at the window, and a voice called to the driver to stop. The carriage stopped as soon as the driver could rein in his horses, and the same voice called to me by my name. I answered, the carriage was then so far in advance of me that the two gentlemen had time to open the door and alight before I came up with it. I observed that they were both wrapped in cloaks, and appeared to conceal themselves. As they stood side by side near the carriage door, I also observed that they both looked of about my own age, or rather younger, and that they were greatly alike, in stature, manner, voice, and, as far as I could see, face, too. "'You are Dr. Manette?' said one. I am. Dr. Manette, formerly of Beauvais, said the other, the young physician, originally an expert surgeon, who within the last year or two has made a rising reputation in Paris. Gentlemen, I returned, I am that Dr. Manette of whom you speak so graciously. We have been to your residence, said the first, and not being so fortunate as to find you there, and being informed that you were probably walking in this direction, we followed in the hope of overtaking you. Will you please to enter the carriage?" The manner of both was imperious, and they both moved as these words were spoken, so as to place me between themselves and the carriage door. They were armed. I was not. "'Gentlemen,' said I, "'pardon me, but I, I usually inquire who does me the honour to seek my assistance, and, and what is the nature to the case to which I am summoned?' The reply to this was made by him who had spoken second. "'Doctor, your clients are people of condition. As to the nature of the case, our confidence in your skill assures us that you will ascertain it for yourself better than we can describe it. Enough. Will you please to enter the carriage?' I could do nothing but comply, and I entered it in silence. They both entered after me, the last springing in after putting up the steps. The carriage turned about, and drove on at its former speed. I repeat this conversation exactly as it occurred. 
I have no doubt that it is, word for word, the same. I describe everything exactly as it took place, constraining my mind not to wander from the task. Where I make the broken marks that follow here, I leave off for the time, and put my paper in its hiding place. The carriage left the streets behind, passed the north barrier, and emerged upon the country road. At two-thirds of a league from the barrier, I did not estimate the distance at that time, but afterwards when I traversed it, it struck out of the main avenue, and presently stopped at a solitary house. We all three alighted, and walked, by a damp soft footpath in a garden, where a neglected fountain had overflowed, to the door of the house. It was not opened immediately, in answer to the ringing of the bell, and one of my two conductors struck the man who opened it with his heavy riding-glove across the face. There was nothing in this action to attract my particular attention, for I had seen common people struck more commonly than dogs, but the other of the two, being angry likewise, struck the man in like manner with his arm. The look and bearing of the brothers were then so exactly alike, I then first perceived them to be twin brothers. From the time of our alighting at the outer gate, which we found locked, and which one of the brothers had opened to admit us, and had re-locked, I had heard cries proceeding from an upper chamber. I was conducted to this chamber straight, the cries growing louder as we ascended the stairs, and I found a patient in a high fever of the brain lying on a bed. The patient was a woman of great beauty, and young, assuredly not much past twenty. Her hair was torn and ragged and her arms were bound to her sides with sashes and handkerchiefs. I noticed that these bonds were all portions of a gentleman's dress. On one of them, which was a fringed scarf for a dress of ceremony, I saw the armorial bearings of a noble, and the letter E. I saw this within the first minute of my contemplation of the patient, for in her restless striving she had turned over on her face on the edge of the bed and had drawn the end of her scarf into her mouth, and was in danger of suffocation. My first act was to put out my hand to relieve her breathing, and in moving the scarf aside, the embroidery in the corner caught my sight. I turned her gently over, placed my hands upon her breast to calm her and keep her down, and looked into her face. Her eyes were dilated and wild, and she constantly uttered piercing shrieks and repeated the words, my husband, my father, and my brother, and then counted up to twelve, and said, Hush! For an instant, and no more, she would pause to listen, and then the piercing shrieks would begin again, and she would repeat the cry, My husband, my father, and my brother, and would count up to twelve, and say, Hush! There was no variation in the order or the manner, there was no cessation, but the regular moment's pause in the utterance of these sounds. How long, I asked, has this lasted? to distinguish the brothers, I will call them the elder and the younger. By the elder I mean him who exercised the most authority. It was the elder who replied, Since about this hour last night. She has a husband, a father, and a brother? A brother. I do not address her brother? He answered with great contempt. No. She has some recent association with the number twelve? The younger brother impatiently rejoined, with twelve o'clock? See, gentlemen, said I, still keeping my hands upon her breast, how useless I am, as you have brought me. If I had known what I was coming to see, I could have come provided. As it is, time must be lost. There are no medicines to be obtained in this lonely place. The elder brother looked to the younger, who said haughtily, There is a case of medicines here, and brought it from a closet, and put it upon a table. I opened some of the bottles, smelt them, and put the stoppers to my lips. If I had wanted to use anything save narcotic medicines that were poisons in themselves, I would not have administered any of those. "'Do you doubt them?' asked the younger brother. "'You see, monsieur, I am going to use them,' I replied, and said no more. I made the patient swallow, with great difficulty, and after many efforts the dose that I desired to give— as I intended to repeat it after a while, and as it was necessary to watch its influence, I then sat down by the side of the bed. There was a timid and suppressed woman in attendance, wife of the man downstairs, who had retreated into a corner. The house was damp and decayed, 
indifferently furnished, evidently recently occupied and temporarily used. Some thick old hangings had been nailed up before the windows to deaden the sound of the shrieks. They continued to be uttered in their regular succession, with the cry, My husband, my father, and my brother, the counting up to twelve, and hush. The frenzy was so violent that I had not unfastened the bandages restraining the arms, but I had looked to them to see that they were not painful. The only spark of encouragement in the case was that my hand upon the sufferer's breast had this much soothing influence, that for minutes at a time it tranquilized the figure. It had no effect upon the cries. No pendulum could be more regular. For the reason that my hand had this effect, I assume, I had sat by the side of the bed for half an hour with the two brothers looking on, before the elder said, "'There is another patient.' I was startled, and asked, "'Is it a pressing case?' "'You had better see,' he carelessly answered, and took up a light. The other patient lay in a back room across a second staircase, which was a species of loft over a stable. There was a low plastered ceiling to a part of it, the rest was open, to the ridge of the tiled roof, and there were beams across. Hay and straw were stored in the portion of the place, faggots for firing, and a heap of apples in sand. I had to pass through that part to get at the other. My memory is circumstantial and unshaken. I try it with these details, and I see them all, in this my cell in the Bastille, near the close of the tenth year of my captivity, as I saw them all that night." On some hay on the ground, with a cushion thrown under his head, lay a handsome peasant boy, a boy of not more than seventeen at the most. He lay on his back, with his teeth set, his right hand clenched on his breast, and his glaring eyes looking straight upward. I could not see where his wound was as I kneeled on one knee over him, but I could see that he was dying of a wound from a sharp point. "'I am a doctor, my poor fellow,' said I. Let me examine it. I do not want it examined, he answered. Let it be. It was under his hand, and I soothed him to let me move his hand away. The wound was a sword thrust, received from twenty to twenty-four hours before, but no skill could have saved him if it had been looked to without delay. He was then dying fast. As I turned my eyes to the elder brother, I saw him looking down at this handsome boy whose life was ebbing out, as if he were a wounded bird, or hare, or a rabbit, not at all as if he were a fellow creature. "'How has this been done, monsieur?' said I. A crazed young common dog, a serf, forced my brother to draw upon him, and has fallen by my brother's sword, like a gentleman. There was no touch of pity, sorrow, or kindred humanity in this answer. The speaker seemed to acknowledge that it was inconvenient to have that different order of creature dying there, and that it would have been better if he had died in the usual obscure routine of his vermin kind. He was quite incapable of any compassionate feeling about the boy, or about his fate. The boy's eyes had slowly moved to him as he had spoken, and they now slowly moved to me. "'Doctor, they are very proud, these nobles, but we common dogs are proud, too, sometimes.' They plunder us, outrage us, beat us, kill us, but we have a little pride left sometimes. She... Uh, ha have you seen her, doctor? The shrieks and cries were audible there, though subdued by, by the distance. He referred to them as if she were lying in our presence. I said, uh, I have seen her. She is my sister, doctor. They have had their shameful rights, these nobles, in the modesty and virtue of our sisters, many years. But we have had good girls among us, I know it, and have heard my father say so. She was a good girl. She was betrothed to a good young man, too, a tenant of his. We were all tenants of his, that man's who stands there. The other is his brother, the worst of a bad race." It was with the greatest difficulty that the boy gathered bodily force to speak, but his spirit spoke with a dreadful emphasis. We were so robbed by that man who stands there, as all we common dogs are by those superior beings, taxed by him without mercy, obliged to work for him without pay, obliged to grind our corn at his mill, 
obliged to feed scores of his tame birds on our wretched crops, and forbidden for our lives to keep a single tame bird of our own, pillaged and plundered to that degree that when we chanced to have a bit of meat we ate it in fear, with the door barred and the shutters closed so his people should not see it and take it from us. I say we were so robbed, and hunted, and were made so poor, that our father told us it was a dreadful thing to bring a child into the world, and that what we should pray most for was that our women might be barren, and our miserable race die out. I had never before seen the sense of being oppressed, bursting forth like a fire. I had supposed that it must be latent in the people somewhere, but I had never seen it break out until I saw it in the dying boy. Nevertheless, doctor, my sister married. He was ailing at that time, poor fellow, and she married her lover that she might tend and comfort him in our cottage, our dog-hut, as that man would call it. She had not been married many weeks when that man's brother saw her and admired her and asked that man to lend her to him, for what are husbands among us? He was willing enough, but my sister was good and virtuous, and hated his brother with a hatred as strong as mine. What did the two then to persuade her husband to use his influence with her, to make her willing? The boy's eyes, which had been fixed on mine, slowly turned to the looker-on, and I saw in the two faces that all he said was true, the two opposing kinds of pride confronting one another. I can see, even in this Bastille, the gentlemen's all negligent and indifference, the peasants all trodden down sentiment and passionate revenge. You know, doctor, that it is among the rights of these nobles to harness us common dogs to carts and drive us. They so harnessed him and drove him. You know that it is among their rights to keep us in their grounds all night, quieting the frogs, in order that their noble sleep may not be disturbed. They kept him out in the unwholesome mists at night, and ordered him back into his harness in the day, but he was not persuaded. No, taken out of harness one day at noon to feed, if he could find food he sobbed twelve times, once for every stroke of the bell, and died on her bosom. Nothing human could have held life in the boy but his determination to tell all his wrong. He forced back the gathering shadows of death, as he forced his clenched right hand to remain clenched and to cover his wound. Then, with that man's permission, and even with his aid, his brother took her away. In spite of what I know, she must have told his brother, and what that is will not be long unknown to you, doctor, if it is now. His brother took her away for his pleasure and diversion for a little while. I saw her pass me on the road. When I took the tidings home, our father's heart burst. He never spoke one of the words that filled it. I took my young sister, for I have another, to a place beyond the reach of this man, and where at least she will never be his vassal. Then I tracked the brother here, and last night climbed in, a common dog, but sword in hand. Where is the loft window? It was somewhere here. The room was darkening to his sight. The world was narrowing around him. I glanced about me and saw that the hay and straw were trampled over the floor as if there had been a struggle. She heard me and ran in. I told her not to come near us until he was dead. He came in and first tossed me some pieces of money, then struck at me with a whip. But I, though a common dog, so struck at him as to make him draw. Let him break into as many pieces as he will. The sword that he stained with my common blood, he drew to defend himself, thrust at me with all his skill for his life. My glance had fallen but a few moments before on the fragments of a broken sword lying among the hay. The weapon was a gentleman's. In another place lay an old sword that seemed to have been a soldier's. Now lift me up, doctor. Lift me up. Where is he? He is not here, I said, supporting the boy, and thinking that he referred to the brother. He? Proud as these nobles are, he is afraid to see me. Where is the man who was here? Turn my face to him." I did so, raising the boy's head against my knee, but invested for the moment with extraordinary power. He raised himself completely, 
obliging me to rise, too, or I could not have still supported him. "'Marquis,' said the boy, turned to him with his eyes open wide, and with his right hand raised, "'in the days when all these things are to be answered for, I summon you and yours to the last of your bad race to answer for them. I mark this cross of blood upon you as a sign that I do it. In the days when all these things are to be answered for, I summon your brother, the worst of the bad race, to answer for them separately. I mark this cross of blood upon him as a sign that I do it. Twice he put his hand to the wound in his breast, and with his forefinger drew a cross in the air. He stood for an instant with the finger yet raised, and as it dropped, he dropped with it, and I laid him down dead. When I returned to the bedside of that young woman, I found her raving in precisely the same order of continuity. I knew that this might last for many hours, and that it would probably end in the silence of the grave. I repeated the medicines I had given her and I sat at the side of the bed until the night was far advanced. She never abated the piercing quality of her shrieks, and never stumbled in the distinctness or the order of her words. They were always, my husband, my father, and my brother. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Hush! This lasted twenty-six hours from the time when I first saw her. I had come and gone twice, and was again sitting by her when she began to falter. I did what little could be done to assist that opportunity, and by and by she sank into a lethargy and lay like the dead. It was as if the wind and rain had lulled at last after a long and fearful storm. I released her arms, and called the woman to assist me to compose her figure in the dress she had torn. It was then that I knew her condition to be that of one in whom the first expectations of being a mother have arisen, and it was then that I lost the little hope I had had of her. "'Is she dead?' asked the Marquis, whom I will still describe as the elder brother, coming booted into the room from his horse. "'Not dead,' said I, "'but like to die.' "'What strength is there in these common bodies?' he said, looking down at her with some curiosity. "'There is prodigious strength,' I answered him, "'in sorrow and despair.' He first laughed at my words, and then frowned at them. He moved a chair with his foot near to mine, ordered the woman away, and said in a subdued voice, "'Doctor, finding my brother in this difficulty with these hinds, I recommended that your aid should be invited.' Your reputation is high, and as a young man with your fortune to make, you are probably mindful of your interest. The things that you see here are things to be seen, and not spoken of." I listened to the patient's breathing, and avoided answering. "'Do you honour me with your attention, doctor?' "'Monsieur,' said I, "'in my profession the communications of patients are always received in confidence. I was guarded in my answer, for I was troubled in my mind with what I had heard and seen. Her breathing was so difficult to trace that I carefully tried the pulse and the heart. There was life, and no more. Looking round as I resumed my seat, I found both the brothers intent upon me. I write with so much difficulty. The cold is so severe. I am so fearful of being detected and consigned to an underground cell and total darkness that I must abridge this narrative. There is no confusion or failure in my memory. It can recall and could detail every word that was ever spoken between me and those brothers. She lingered for a week. Towards the last I could understand some few syllables that she said to me by placing my ear close to her lips. She asked me where she was, and I told her who I was, and I, and I told her. It was in vain that I asked her for her family name. She faintly shook her head upon the pillow, and kept her secret as the boy had done. I had no opportunity of asking her any question, until I had told the brothers she was sinking fast, and could not live another day. Until then, though no one was ever presented to her consciousness save the woman and myself, one or other of them had always jealously sat behind the curtain at the head of the bed when I was there. 
but when it came to that they seemed careless what communication I might hold with her, as if the thought passed through my mind, I were dying too. I always observed that their pride bitterly resented the younger brothers, as I call him, having crossed swords with a peasant, and that peasant a boy. The only consideration that appeared to affect the mind of either of them was the consideration that this was highly degrading to the family, and was ridiculous. As often as I caught the younger brother's eyes, their expression reminded me that he disliked me deeply, for knowing what I knew from the boy. He was smoother and more polite to me than the elder, but I saw this. I also saw that I was an encumbrance in the mind of the elder, too. My patient died, two hours before midnight, at a time by my watch answering almost to the minute when I had first seen her. I was alone with her when her forlorn young head drooped gently on one side, and all her earthly wrongs and sorrows ended. The brothers were waiting in a room downstairs, impatient to ride away. I had heard them alone at the bedside, striking their boots with their riding whips and loitering up and down. "'At last she is dead,' said the elder when I went in. "'She is dead,' said I. "'I congratulate you, my brother,' were his words as he turned round. He had before offered me money, which I had postponed taking. He now gave me a rouleau of gold. I took it from his hand, but laid it on the table. I had considered the question, and had resolved to accept nothing. "'Pray excuse me,' said I. Uh, "'Under the circumstances, no.' They exchanged looks, but bent their heads to me as I bent mine to them, and we parted without another word on either side. I, I am weary, 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 worn down by misery. I cannot read what I have written with this gaunt hand. Early in the morning the rouleau of gold was left at my door in a little box, with my name on the outside. From the first I had anxiously considered what I ought to do. I decided that day to write privately to the minister, stating the nature of the two cases to which I had been summoned, and the place to which I had gone, in effect stating all the circumstances. I knew what court influence was, and what the immunities of the nobles were, and I expected that the matter would never be heard of, but I wished to relieve my own mind. I had kept the matter a profound secret, even from my wife, and this too I resolved to state in my letter. I had no apprehension whatever of my real danger, but I was conscious that there might be danger to others, if others were compromised by possessing the knowledge that I possessed. I was much engaged that day, and could not complete my letter that night. I rose long before my usual time next morning to finish it. It, it was the last day of the year. The letter was lying before me, just completed, when I was told that a lady waited who wished to see me. I am growing more and more unequal to the task I have set myself. It is so cold, so dark, my senses are so benumbed, and the gloom upon me is so dreadful. The lady was young, engaging and handsome, but not marked for long life. She was in great agitation. She presented herself to me as the wife of the Marquis saint Avramont. I connected the title by which the boy had addressed the elder brother with the initial letter embroidered on the scarf, and had no difficulty in arriving at the conclusion that I had seen that nobleman very lately. My memory is still accurate, but I cannot write the words of our conversation. I suspect that I am watched more closely than I was, and I know not at what times I may be watched. She had in part suspected, and in part discovered, the main facts of the cruel story, of her husband's share in it, and my being resorted to. She did not know that the girl was dead. Her hope had been, she said, in great distress, to show her, in secret, a woman's sympathy. Her hope had been to avert the wrath of heaven from a house that had long been hateful to the suffering many. She had reasons for believing that there was a young sister living, and her greatest desire was to help that sister. I could tell her nothing but that there was such a sister. Beyond that I knew nothing. Her inducement to come to me, relying on my confidence, had been the hope that I could tell her the name and place of abode, 
whereas to this wretched hour I am ignorant of both. These scraps of paper fail me. One was taken from me with a warning yesterday. I must finish my record to-day. She was a good, compassionate lady, and not happy in her marriage. How could she be? The brother distrusted and disliked her, and his influence was all opposed to her. She stood in dread of him, and in dread of her husband, too. When I handed her down to the door there was a child, a pretty boy from two to three years old, in her carriage. "'For his sake, doctor,' she said, pointing to him in tears, "'I would do all I can to make what poor amends I can. He will never prosper in his inheritance otherwise. I have a presentiment that if no other innocent atonement is made for this it will one day be required of him. What I have left to call my own, it is little beyond the worth of a few jewels, I will make it the first charge of his life to bestow, with the compassion and lamenting of his dead mother, on this injured family, if the sister can be discovered." She kissed the boy, and said, caressing him, "'It is for thine own dear sake. Thou wilt be faithful, little Charles?' The child answered her bravely, "'Yes.' I kissed her hand, and she took him in her arms, and went away caressing him. I never saw her more. As she had mentioned her husband's name in the faith that I knew it, I added no mention of it to my letter. I sealed my letter, and not trusting it out of my own hands, delivered it myself that day. That night, the last night of the year, towards nine o'clock a man in black dress rang at my gate, demanded to see me, and softly followed my servant, Ernest Defarge, a youth, upstairs. When my servant came into the room where I sat with my wife, oh, my wife, beloved of my heart, my fair young English wife, we saw the man who was supposed to be at the gate standing silent behind him. An urgent case in the Rue saint Anouar, he said. It would not detain me. He had a coach in waiting. It brought me here. It brought me to my grave. When I was clear of the house, a black muffler was drawn tightly over my mouth from behind, and my arms were pinioned. The two brothers crossed the road from a dark corner, and identified me with a single gesture. The Marquis took from his pocket the letter I had written, showed it to me, burnt it in the light of a lantern that was held, and extinguished the ashes with his foot. Not a word was spoken. I was brought here, I was brought to my living grave. If it had pleased God to put it in the hard heart of either of the brothers, in all these frightful years, to grant me any tidings of my dearest wife, so much as to let me know by a word whether alive or dead, I might have thought that he had not quite abandoned them. But now I believe that the mark of the Red Cross is fatal to them, and that they have no part in his mercies and them and their descendants to the last of their race, I, Alexandre Manette, unhappy prisoner, do this last night of the year, 1767, in my unbearable agony, denounce to the times when all these things shall be answered for. I denounce them to heaven and to earth. A terrible sound arose when the reading of this document was done. A sound of craving and eagerness that had nothing articulate in it but blood. The narrative called up the most revengeful passions of the time, and there was not a head in the nation but must have dropped before it. Little need, in the presence of that tribunal and that auditory, to show how the Defarges had not made the paper public with the other captured Bastille memorials born in procession, and had kept it biding their time little need to show this detested family name had long been anathematized by St. Antoine, and was wrought into the fatal register. The man never trod ground whose virtues and services would have sustained him in that place that day against such denunciation. And all the worse for the doomed man, that the denouncer was a well-known citizen, his own attached friend, the father of his wife. 
One of the frenzied aspirations of the populace was for imitations of the questionable public virtues of antiquity, and for sacrifices and self-immolations on the people's altar. Therefore, when the President said, else had his own head quivered on his shoulders, that the good physician of the Republic would deserve better still of the Republic by rooting out an obnoxious family of aristocrats, and would doubtless feel a sacred glow and joy in making his daughter a widow, and her child an orphan, there was wild excitement, patriotic fervor, not a touch of human sympathy. "'Much influence around him has that doctor,' murmured Madame Defarge, smiling to the vengeance. "'Save him now, my doctor, save him!' At every juryman's vote there was a roar, another and another, roar and roar. Unanimously voted, at heart and by dissent an aristocrat, an enemy of the Republic, a notorious oppressor of the people. Back to the conciergerie, and death within four and twenty hours. End of Book 3, Chapter 10 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deborah Clark, Winnipeg, Canada. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book 3, Chapter 11, Dusk. The wretched wife of the innocent man thus doomed to die fell under the sentence as if she had been mortally stricken. But she uttered no sound, and so strong was the voice within her, representing that it was she of all the world who must uphold him in his misery, and not augment it, that it quickly raised her, even from that shock. The judges, having to take part in a public demonstration out of doors, the tribunal adjourned. The quick noise and movement of the court's emptying itself by many passengers had not ceased when Lucy stood stretching out her arms towards her husband with nothing in her face but love and consolation. If I might touch him, if I might embrace him once, oh, good citizens, if you would have so much compassion for us. There was but a jailer left, along with two of the four men who had taken him last night and Barsad. The people had all poured out to the show in the streets. Barsad proposed to the rest. Let her embrace him, then. It is but a moment. It was silently acquiesced in, and they passed her over the seats in the hall to a raised place, where he, by leaning over the dock, could fold her in his arms. Farewell, dear darling of my soul, my parting blessing on my love. We shall meet again, where the weary are at rest." They were her husband's words, as he held her to his bosom. I can bear it, dear Charles. I am supported from above. Don't suffer for me. A parting blessing for our child. I send it to her by you. I kiss her by you. I say farewell to her by you. My husband, no, a moment. He was tearing himself apart from her. We shall not be long separated. I feel that this will break my heart by and by. But I will do my duty while I can. And when I leave her... God will raise up friends for her, as he did for me. Her father had followed her, and would have fallen on his knees to both of them, but that Darnay put out a hand and seized him, crying, No, no, what have you done, what have you done, that you should kneel to us? We know now what a struggle you have made of old. We know now what you underwent when you suspected my descent, and when you knew it. We know now the natural antipathy you strove against, and conquered for her dear sake. We thank you with all our hearts, and all our love and duty. Heaven be with you. Her father's only answer was to draw his hands through his white hair, and wring them with a shriek of anguish. It could not be otherwise, said the prisoner. All things have worked together as they have fallen out. It was the always vain endeavour to discharge my poor mother's trust that first brought my fatal presence near you. Good could never come of such evil, and a happier end was not in nature to so unhappy a beginning. Be comforted, and forgive me. Heaven bless you. As he was drawn away, his wife released him, and stood looking after him with her hands touching one another in the attitude of prayer. 
and with a radiant look upon her face, in which there was even a comforting smile. As he went out at the prisoner's door, she turned, laid her head lovingly on her father's breast, tried to speak to him, and fell at his feet. Then issuing from the obscure corner from which he had never moved, Sidney Carton came and took her up. Only her father and Mr. Lorry were with her. His arm trembled as it raised her and supported her head. Yet there was an air about him that was not all of pity, that had a flush of pride in it. Shall I take her to a coach? I shall never feel her weight. He carried her lightly to the door and laid her tenderly down in a coach. Her father and their old friend got into it, and he took his seat beside the driver. When they arrived at the gateway where he had paused in the dark not many hours before, to picture to himself on which of the rough stones of the street her feet had trodden, he lifted her again and carried her up the staircase to their rooms. There he laid her down on a couch where her child and Miss Pross wept over her. Don't recall her to herself, he said softly to the latter. She is better so. Don't revive her to consciousness while she only faints. Oh, Carton, Carton, dear Carton, cried little Lucy, springing up and throwing her arms passionately round him in a burst of grief. Now that you have come, I think you will do something to help Mamma, something to save Papa. Oh, look at her, dear Carton. Can you, of all people who love her, bear to see her so? He bent over the child and laid her blooming cheek against his face. He put her gently from him and looked at her unconscious mother. Before I go, he said, and paused, I may kiss her. It was remembered afterwards that when he bent down and touched her face with his lips, he murmured some words. The child, who was nearest to him, told them afterwards, and told her grandchildren when she was a handsome old lady, that she heard him say, A life you love. When he had gone out into the next room, he turned suddenly on Mr. Lorry and her father, who were following, and said to the latter, You had great influence but yesterday, Dr. Manette. Let it at least be tried. These judges and all the men in power are very friendly to you, and very recognizant of your services are they not? Nothing connected with Charles was concealed from me. I had the strongest assurances that I should save him, and I did. He returned the answer in great trouble, and very slowly. Try them again. The hours between this and tomorrow afternoon are few and short. But try. I intend to try. I will not rest a moment. That's well. I have known such energy as yours do great things before now. Though never, he added, with a smile and a sigh together, such great things as this. But try. Of little worth as life is when we misuse it, it is worth that effort. It would cost nothing to lay down, if it were not. I will go, said Dr. Manette, to the prosecutor and the president straight, and I will go to others whom it is better not to name. I will write, too, and, but stay, there is a celebration in the streets, and no one will be accessible until dark. That's true. Well, it is a forlorn hope at best, and not much more the forlorner for being delayed till dark. I should like to know how you speed, though, mind. I expect nothing. When are you likely to have seen these dread powers, Dr. Manette? Immediately after dark, I should hope. Within an hour or two from this. It will be dark soon after four. Let us stretch the hour or two. If I go to Mr. Lorry's at nine, shall I hear what you have done, either from our friend or from yourself? Yes. May you prosper. Mr. Lorry followed Sidney to the outer door, and, touching him on the shoulder as he was going away, caused him to turn. I have no hope, said Mr. Lorry, in a low and sorrowful whisper. Nor have I. If any one of these men, or all of these men, were disposed to spare him, which is a large supposition, for what is his life or any man's to them. I doubt if they durst spare him after the demonstration in the court. And so do I. I heard the fall of the axe in that sound. Mr. Lorry leaned his arm upon the doorpost and bowed his face upon it. Don't despond, said Carton very gently. Don't grieve. I encouraged Dr. Manette in this idea, because I felt that it might one day be 
consolatory to her. Otherwise she might think his life was want only thrown away or wasted, and that might trouble her. Yes, yes, returned Mr. Lorry, drying his eyes. You are right. But he will perish. There is no real hope. Yes, he will perish. There is no real hope, echoed Carton, and walked with a settled step downstairs. End of Book Three Chapter Eleven This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deborah Clark, Winnipeg, Canada. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Three, Chapter Twelve Darkness. Sidney Carton paused in the street, not quite decided where to go. At Telson's banking house, at nine, he said, with a musing face. Shall I do well in the meantime to show myself? I think so. It is best that these people should know that there is such a man as I here. It is a sound precaution, and may be a necessary preparation. But care, care, care. Let me think it out. Checking his steps, which had begun to tend towards an object, he took a turn or two in the already darkening street, and traced the thought in his mind to its possible consequences. His first impression was confirmed. It is best, he said, finally resolved, that these people should know that there is such a man as I here. And he turned his face towards St. Antoine. Defarge had described himself that day as the keeper of a wine shop in the St. Antoine suburb. It was not difficult for one who knew the city well to find his house without asking any question. Having ascertained its situation, Carlton came out of those closer streets again and dined at a place of refreshment, and fell sound asleep after dinner. For the first time in many years he had no strong drink. Since last night he had taken nothing but a little light thin wine. And last night he dropped the brandy slowly down on Mr. Lorry's hearth like a man who had done with it. It was as late as seven o'clock when he awoke refreshed and went out into the streets again. As he passed along towards St. Antoine, he stopped at a shop window where there was a mirror, and slightly altered the disordered arrangement of his loose cravat and his coat collar and his wild hair. This done, he went on direct to Defarge's and went in. There happened to be no customer in the shop but Jacques Three, of the restless fingers and the croaking voice. This man, whom he had seen upon the jury, stood drinking at the little counter, in conversation with the Defarges, man and wife. The vengeance assisted in the conversation like a regular member of the establishment. As Carton walked in, took his seat, and asked, in very indifferent French, for a small measure of wine, Madame Defarge cast a careless glance at him, and then a keener, and then a keener, and then advanced to him herself and asked him what it was he had ordered. He repeated what he had already said. English, asked Madame Defarge, inquisitively raising her dark eyebrows. After looking at her as if the sound of even a single French word were slow to express itself to him, he answered in his former strong foreign accent, Yes, Madame, yes, I am English. Madame Defarge, returned to her counter to get the wine, and, as he took up a Jacobin journal and feigned to pour over it, puzzling out its meaning, he heard her say, I swear to you, like Evremond. Defarge brought him the wine and gave him good evening. How? Good evening. Oh, good evening, citizen, filling his glass. Ah, and good wine. I drink to the Republic. Defarge went back to the counter and said, Certainly a little like. Madame sternly retorted. I tell you, a good deal like. Jacques Three pacifically remarked. He is so much in your mind, you see, Madame. The amiable vengeance added with a laugh. Yes, my faith. And you are looking forward with so much pleasure to seeing him once more tomorrow. Carton followed the lines and words of his paper with a slow forefinger and with a studious and absorbed face. They were all leaning their arms on the counter close together, speaking low. 
After a silence of a few moments, during which they all looked towards him without disturbing his outward attention from the Jacobin editor, they resumed their conversation. Why stop? There is great force in that. Why stop? Well, well, reasoned Defarge, but one must stop somewhere. After all, the question is still where. At extermination, said Madame. Magnificent, croaked Jacques Three. The vengeance also highly approved. Extermination is good doctrine, my wife, said Defarge, rather troubled. In general, I say nothing against it. But this doctor has suffered much. You have seen him to-day. You have observed his face when the paper was read. I have observed his face, repeated Madame, contemptuously and angrily. Yes, I have observed his face. I have observed his face to be not the face of a true friend of the Republic. Let him take care of his face. And you have observed, my wife, said Defarge, in a deprecatory manner, the anguish of his daughter, which must be a dreadful anguish to him. I have observed his daughter, repeated Madame. Yes, I have observed his daughter more times than one. I have observed her to-day, and I have observed her other days. I have observed her in the court, and I have observed her in the street by the prison. Let me but lift my finger. She seemed to raise it, the listener's eyes were always on his paper, and to let it fall with a rattle on the ledge before her, as if the axe had dropped. The citizeness is superb, croaked the juryman. She is an angel, said the vengeance, and embraced her. As to thee, pursued Madame, implacably addressing her husband, if it depended on thee, which happily it does not, thou wouldst rescue this man even now. No, protested Defarge, not if to lift this glass would do it. But I would leave the matter there. I say stop there. See you then, Jacques, said Madame Defarge wrathfully, and see you too, my little vengeance, see you both. Listen, for other crimes as tyrants and oppressors I have this race a long time on my register, doomed to destruction and extermination. Ask my husband, is that so? It is so, assented Defarge, without being asked. In the beginning of the great days, when the Bastille falls, he finds this paper of to-day, and he brings it home, and in the middle of the night, when this place is clear and shut, we read it. Here on this spot, by the light of this lamp, ask him, is that so? It is so, assented Defarge. That night, I tell him, when the paper is read through, and the lamp is burnt out, and the day is gleaming in above those shutters and between those iron bars, that I have now a secret to communicate. Ask him, is that so? It is so, assented Defarge again. I communicate to him that secret. I smite this bosom with these two hands as I smite it now, and I tell him, Defarge, I was brought up among the fishermen of the seashore. And that peasant family so injured by those two Evremond brothers, as that Bastille paper describes, is my family. Defarge, that sister of the mortally wounded boy upon the ground, was my sister. That husband was my sister's husband. That unborn child was their child. That brother was my brother. That father was my father. Those are my dead. And that summons to answer for those things descends to me. Ask him, is that so? It is so, assented Defarge, once more. Then tell wind and fire where to stop, returned Madame, but don't tell me. Both her hearers derived a horrible enjoyment from the deadly nature of her wrath. The listener could feel how white she was without seeing her, and both highly commended it. Defarge, a weak minority, interposed a few words for the memory of the compassionate wife of the Marquis, but only elicited from his own wife a repetition of her last reply. Tell the wind and the fire where to stop, not me. Customers entered, and the group was broken up. The English customer paid for what he had had, perplexedly counted his change, and asked, as a stranger, to be directed towards the National Palace. Madame Defarge took him to the door, and put her arm on his in pointing out the road. The English customer was not without his reflections, then, that it might be a good deed to seize that arm, lift it, and strike under it sharp and deep. But he went his way, and was soon swallowed up in the shadow of the prison wall. 
At the appointed hour he emerged from it to present himself in Mr. Lorry's room again, where he found the old gentleman walking to and fro in restless anxiety. He said he had been with Lucy until just now, and had only left her for a few minutes to come and keep his appointment. Her father had not been seen since he quitted the banking-house towards four o'clock. She had some faint hopes that his mediation might save Charles, but they were very slight. He had been more than five hours gone. Where could he be? Mr. Lorry waited until ten, but Dr. Manat not returning, and he, being unwilling to leave Lucy any longer, it was arranged that he should go back to her, and come to the banking-house again at midnight. In the meantime, Carton would wait alone by the fire for the doctor. He waited and waited, and the clock struck twelve, but Dr. Manette did not come back. Mr. Lorry returned and found no tidings of him, and brought none. Where could he be? They were discussing this question, and were almost building up some weak structure of hope on his prolonged absence when they heard him on the stairs. The instant he entered the room it was plain that all was lost. Whether he had been to any one, or whether he had been all that time traversing the streets was never known. As he stood staring at them they asked him no questions, for his face told them everything. "'I cannot find it,' said he, "'and I must have it. Where is it?' His head and throat were bare, and, as he spoke with a helpless look straying all around, he took his coat off and let it drop to the floor. "'Where is my bench? I have been looking everywhere for my bench, and I can't find it. What have they done with my work? Time presses. I must finish those shoes.' They looked at one another, and their hearts died within them. "'Come, come,' he said, in a whimpering, miserable way. "'Let me get to work. Give me my work.' Receiving no answer, he tore his hair and beat his feet upon the ground, like a distracted child. "'Don't torture a poor, forlorn wretch,' he implored them, with a dreadful cry. "'But give me my work. What is to become of us if those shoes are not done to-night?' Lost, utterly lost. It was so clearly beyond hope to reason with him, or try to restore him, that, as if by agreement, they each put a hand upon his shoulder— and soothed him to sit down before the fire, with a promise that he should have his work presently. He sank into the chair and brooded over the embers, and shed tears. As if all that had happened since the garret time were a momentary fancy or a dream, Mr. Lorry saw him shrink into the exact figure that Defarge had had in keeping. Affected and impressed with terror as they both were, by this spectacle of ruin, it was not a time to yield to such emotions. His lonely daughter, bereft of her final hope and reliance, appealed to them both too strongly. Again, as if by agreement, they looked at one another with one meaning in their faces. Carton was the first to speak. The last chance is gone. It was not much. Yes, he had better be taken to her. But before you go, will you for a moment steadily attend to me? Don't ask me why I make the stipulations I am going to make, and exact the promise I am going to exact. I have a reason, a good one. I do not doubt it, answered Mr. Lorry. Say on. The figure in the chair between them was all the time monotonously rocking itself to and fro and moaning. They spoke in such a tone as they would have used if they had been watching by a sick bed in the night. Carton stooped to pick up the coat which lay almost entangling his feet. As he did so, a small case, in which the doctor was accustomed to carry the lists of his day's duties, fell lightly to the floor. Carton took it up, and there was a folded paper in it. "'We should look at this,' he said. Mr. Lorry nodded his consent. He opened it and exclaimed, "'Thank God!' "'What is it?' asked Mr. Lorry eagerly. "'A moment. Let me speak of it in its place. First. He put his hand in his coat and took another paper from it. That is the certificate which enables me to pass out of this city. Look at it, you see? Sidney Carton, an Englishman. Mr. Lorry held it open in his hand, gazing in his earnest face. Keep it for me until tomorrow. I shall see him tomorrow, you remember, and I had better not take it into the prison. Why not? I don't know. I prefer not to do so. Now take this paper that Dr. Minette has carried about him. It is a similar certificate, enabling him and his daughter and her child at any time to pass the barrier and the frontier, you see? Yes. 
Perhaps he obtained it as his last and utmost precaution against evil yesterday. When is it dated? But no matter. Don't stay to look. Put it up carefully with mine and your own. Now observe, I never doubted until within this hour or two that he had or could have had such a paper. It is good until recalled, but it may be soon recalled, and I have reason to think will be. They are not in danger. They are in great danger. They are in danger of denunciation by Madame Defarge. I know it from her own lips. I have overheard words of that woman's, to-night, which have presented their danger to me in strong colours. I have lost no time, and since then I have seen the spy. He confirms me. He knows that a wood-sawyer, living by the prison wall, is under the control of the Defarges, and has been rehearsed by Madame Defarge as to his having seen her, he never mentioned Lucy's name, making signs and signals to prisoners. It is easy to foresee that the pretense will be the common one, a prison plot, and that it will involve her life, and perhaps her child's, and perhaps her father's, for both have been seen with her at that place. Don't look so horrified. You will save them all. Heaven grant I may, Carton, but how? I am going to tell you how. It will depend on you, and it could depend on no better man. This new denunciation will certainly not take place until after to-morrow, probably not until two or three days afterwards, probably a week afterwards. You know it is a capital crime to mourn for or sympathize with a victim of the guillotine. She and her father would unquestionably be guilty of this crime, and this woman, the inveteracy of whose pursuit cannot be described, would wait to add that strength to her case and make herself doubly sure. You follow me? So attentively, and with so much confidence in what you say, that for a moment I lose sight, touching the back of the doctor's chair, even of this distress. You have money and can buy the means of travelling to the sea-coast as quickly as the journey can be made. Your preparations have been completed for some days to return to England. Early to-morrow have your horses ready, so that they may be in starting trim at two o'clock in the afternoon. It shall be done. His manner was so fervent and inspiring that Mr. Lorry caught the flame and was as quick as youth. You are a noble heart. Did I say we could depend on no better man? Tell her to-night what you know of her danger as involving her child and her father. Dwell upon that, for she would lay her own fair head beside her husband's cheerfully. He faltered for an instant, and then went on as before. For the sake of her child and her father— Press upon her the necessity of leaving Paris, with them and you, at that hour. Tell her that it was her husband's last arrangement. Tell her that more depends on it than she dare believe or hope. You think her father, even in this sad state, will submit himself to her, do you not? I am sure of it. I thought so. Quietly and steadily have all these arrangements made in the courtyard here, even to the taking of your own seat in the carriage. The moment I come to you, take me in and drive away. I understand that I wait for you under all circumstances. You have my certificate in your hand with the rest, you know, and will reserve my place. Wait for nothing but to have my place occupied, and then for England. Why then, said Mr. Lorry, grasping his eager but so firm and steady hand, it does not all depend on one old man, but I shall have a young and ardent man at my side. By the help of heaven you shall. Promise me solemnly that nothing will influence you to alter the course on which we now stand pledged to one another. Nothing, Carton. Remember these words to-morrow. Change the course, or delay in it, for any reason, and no life can possibly be saved, and many lives must inevitably be sacrificed. I will remember them. I hope to do my part faithfully, and I hope to do mine. Now good-bye." though he said it with a grave smile of earnestness, and though he even put the old man's hand to his lips, he did not part from him then. He helped him so far to arouse the rocking figure before the dying embers, as to get a cloak and a hat put upon it, and to tempt it forth to find where the bench and work were hidden that it still moaningly besought to have. He walked on the other side of it and protected it to the courtyard of the house where the afflicted heart so happy in the memorable time when he had revealed his own desolate heart to it, outwatched the awful night. 
He entered the courtyard, and remained there for a few moments alone, looking up at the light in the window of her room. Before he went away, he breathed a blessing towards it, and a farewell. End of Book 3 Chapter 12「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Caroline Morse. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Three, Chapter Thirteen. Fifty-two. In the black prison of the Conciergerie, the doomed of the day awaited their fate. They were in number as the weeks of the year. Fifty-two were to roll that afternoon, on the life-tide of the city, to the boundless everlasting sea. Before their cells were quit of them, new occupants were appointed. Before their blood ran into the blood spilled yesterday, the blood that was to mingle with theirs to-morrow was already set apart. Two score and twelve were told off. From the farmer-general of seventy, whose riches could not buy his life, to the seamstress of twenty, whose poverty and obscurity could not save her. Physical diseases, engendered in the vices and neglects of men, will seize on victims of all degrees, and the frightful moral disorder, born of unspeakable suffering, intolerable oppression, and heartless indifference, smote equally without distinction. Charles Darnay, alone in a cell, had sustained himself with no flattering delusion since he came to it from the tribunal. In every line of the narrative he had heard, he had heard his condemnation. He had fully comprehended that no personal influence could possibly save him, that he was virtually sentenced by the millions, and that units could avail him nothing. Nevertheless it was not easy, with the face of his beloved wife fresh before him, to compose his mind to what it must bear. His hold on life was strong, and it was very, very hard to loosen. By gradual efforts and degrees, unclosed a little here, it clenched the tighter there and when he brought his strength to bear on that hand, and it yielded, this was closed again. There was a hurry, too, in all his thoughts, a turbulent and heated working of his heart, that contended against resignation. If for a moment he did feel resigned, then his wife and child who had to live after him seemed to protest and to make it a selfish thing. But all this was at first, before long, the consideration that there was no disgrace in the fate he must meet, and that numbers went the same road wrongfully and trod it firmly every day, sprang up to stimulate him. Next followed the thought that much of the future peace of mind enjoyable by the dear ones depended on his quiet fortitude. So by degrees he calmed into the better state, and when he could raise his thoughts much higher and draw comfort down. Before it had set in dark on the night of his condemnation, he had travelled thus far on his last way. Being allowed to purchase the means of writing, and a light, he sat down to write until such time as the prison lamps should be extinguished. He wrote a long letter to Lucy, showing her that he had known nothing of her father's imprisonment until he had heard of it from herself, and that he had been as ignorant as she of his father's and uncle's responsibility for that misery until the paper had been read. He had already explained to her that his concealment from herself of the name he had relinquished was the one condition, fully intelligible now, that her father had attached to their betrothal and was the one promise he had still exacted from her on the morning of their marriage. He entreated her, for her father's sake, never to seek to know whether her father had become oblivious of the existence of the paper, or had had it recalled to him, for the moment or for good, by the story of the tower, on that old Sunday under the dear old plane tree in the garden. If he had preserved any definite remembrance of it, there could be no doubt that he had supposed it destroyed with the Bastille, when he had found no mention of it among the relics of the prisoners which the populace had discovered there, and which had been described to all the world. He besought her, though he added that he knew it was needless, to console her father, by impressing him, through every tender means she could think of, with the truth that he had done nothing for which he could justly reproach himself, but had uniformly forgotten himself for their joint sakes. Next to her preservation of his own last grateful love and blessing, and her overcoming of her sorrow, to devote herself to their dear child, he adjured her, as they would meet in heaven to comfort her father. To her father himself he wrote in the same strain, but he told her father that he expressly confided his wife and child to his care, and he told him this, very strongly, with the hope of rousing him from any despondency or dangerous retrospect toward which he foresaw he might be tending. 
To Mr. Lorry he commended them all, and explained his worldly affairs. That done, with many added sentences of grateful friendship and warm attachment, all was done. He never thought of Carton. His mind was so full of the others that he never once thought of him. He had time to finish these letters before the lights were out. When he lay down on his straw bed he thought he had done with this world. But it beckoned him back in his sleep, and showed itself in shining forms. Free and happy, back in the old house in Soho, though it had nothing in it like the real house, unaccountably released and light of heart. He was with Lucy again, and she told him it was all a dream and he had never gone away. A pause of forgetfulness, and then he had even suffered, and had come back to her, dead and at peace, and yet there was no difference in him. Another pause of oblivion, and he awoke in the somber morning, unconscious where he was of what had happened until it flashed upon his mind. This is the day of my death. Thus he had come through the hours to the day when the fifty-two heads were to fall, and now, while he was composed and hoped that he could meet the end with quiet heroism, a new action began in his waking thoughts which was very difficult to master. He had never seen the instrument that was to terminate his life, how high it was from the ground, how many steps it had, where he would be stood, how he would be touched, whether the touching hands would be dyed red, which way his face would be turned, whether he would be the first or might be the last. These and many similar questions, in no wise directed by his will, obtruded themselves over and over again. Countless times, neither were they connected with fear. He was conscious of no fear. Rather, they originated in a strange besetting desire to know what to do when the time came, a desire gigantically disproportionate to the few swift moments to which it referred, a wondering that was more like the wondering of some other spirit within his than his own. The hours went on as he walked to and fro, and the clocks struck the numbers he would never hear again. Nine, gone forever. Ten, gone forever. Eleven, gone forever. Twelve, coming on to pass away. After a hard contest with that eccentric action of thought, of which it had last perplexed him, he had got the better of it. He walked up and down, softly repeating their names to himself. The worst of the strife was over. He could walk up and down, free from distracting fancies, praying for himself and for them. Twelve, gone forever. He had been apprised that the final hour was three, and he knew he would be summoned some time earlier, inasmuch as the tumbrils jolted heavily and slowly through the streets. Therefore he resolved to keep two before his mind as the hour, and so to strengthen himself in the interval that he might be able, after that time, to strengthen others. Walking regularly to and fro with his arms folded to his breast, a very different man from the prisoner who had walked to and fro at La Force, he heard one strike away from him without surprise. The hour had measured like most other hours. Devoutly thankful to heaven for his recovered self-possession, he thought, there is but another now, and turned to walk again. Footsteps in the stone passage outside the door. He stopped. The key was put in the lock and turned. Before the door was opened, or as it opened, a man said in a low voice in English, He has never seen me here. I have kept out of his way. Go you in alone. I wait near. Lose no time. The door was quickly opened and closed, and there stood before him face to face, quiet, intent upon him, and with the light of a smile upon his features and a cautionary finger on his lip, Sidney Carton. There was something so bright and remarkable in his look that for the first moment the prisoner misdoubted him to be an apparition of his own imagining. But as he spoke, and it was his voice, he took the prisoner's hand, and it was his real grasp. "'Of all the people upon earth you least expected to see me?' he said. "'I could not believe it to be you. I can scarcely believe it now. You are not,' the apprehension came suddenly into his mind, "'a prisoner?' "'No. I am accidentally possessed of a power over one of the keepers here, and in virtue of it I stand before you. I come from her, your wife, dear Darnay.' The prisoner wrung his hand. I bring you a request from her. What is it? A most earnest, pressing, and emphatic entreaty, addressed to you in the most pathetic tones of the voice so dear to you that you well remember. The prisoner turned his face partly aside. You have no time to ask me why I bring it or what it means. I have no time to tell you. You must comply with it. Take off those boots you wear and draw on these of mine. There was a chair against the wall of the cell behind the prisoner. Carton, pressed forward, had already, with the speed of lightning, got him down into it and stood over him barefoot. "'Draw on these boots of mine. Put your hands to them. Put your will to them. Quick!' "'Carton, there is no escaping from this place. It can never be done. You will only die with me. It is madness.' "'It would be madness if I asked you to escape. But do I? 
When I ask you to pass out at that door, tell me it is madness and remain here. Change that cravat for this of mine, that coat for this of mine. While you do it, let me take this ribbon from your hair and shake out your hair like this of mine. With wonderful quickness, and with a strength both of will and action that appeared quite supernatural, he forced all these changes upon him. The prisoner was like a young child in his hands. Carton, dear Carton, it is madness. It cannot be accomplished. It never can be done. It has been attempted and has always failed. I implore you not to add your death to the bitterness of mine. Do I ask you, my dear Darnay, to pass the door? When I ask that, refuse. There are pen and ink and paper on this table. Is your hand steady enough to write? It was when you came in. Steady it again and write what I shall dictate. Quick, friend, quick. Pressing his hand to his bewildered head, Darnay sat down at the table. Carton, with his right hand in his breast, stood close beside him. Write exactly as I speak. To whom do I address it? To no one. Carton still had his hand in his breast. Do I date it? No. The prisoner looked up at each question. Carton, standing over him with his hand in his breast, looked down. If you remember, said Carton, dictating, the words that passed between us long ago, you will readily comprehend this when you see it. You do remember them, I know. It is not in your nature to forget them. He was drawing his hand from his breast. The prisoner, chancing to look up in his hurried wonder as he wrote, the hand stopped, closing upon something. Have you written, forget them? Carton asked. I have. Is that a weapon in your hand? No, I am not armed. What is it in your hand? You shall know directly. Write on. There are but a few words more. He dictated again. I am so thankful that the time has come, when I can prove them, that I do so is no subject for regret or grief. As he said these words with his eyes fixed on the writer, his hand slowly and softly moved down close to the writer's face. The pen dropped from Darnay's fingers on the table, and he looked about him vacantly. What vapor is that? he asked. Vapor? Something that crossed me? I am conscious of nothing. There can be nothing here. Take up the pen and finish. Hurry, hurry! As if his memory were impaired or his faculties disordered, the prisoner made an effort to rally his attention. As he looked at Carton with clouded eyes and with an altered manner of breathing, Carton, his hand again in his breast, looked steadily at him. Hurry, hurry! The prisoner bent over the paper once more. If it had been otherwise, Carton's hand was again watchfully and softly stealing down. I never should have used the longer opportunity. If it had been otherwise, the hand was at the prisoner's face. I should but have had so much the more to answer for. If it had been otherwise. Carton looked at the pen and saw that it was trailing off into unintelligible signs. Carton's hand moved back to his breast no more. The prisoner sprang up with a reproachful look, but Carton's hand was close and firm at his nostrils, and Carton's left arm caught him round the waist. For a few seconds he faintly struggled with the man who had come to lay down his life for him. But with a minute or so he was stretched insensibly on the ground. Quickly, but with hands as true to the purpose as his heart was, Carton dressed himself in the clothes the prisoner had laid aside, combed back his hair, and tied it with the ribbon the prisoner had worn. Then he softly called, "'Enter there! Come in!' and the spy presented himself. "'You see,' said Carton, looking up as he kneeled on one knee beside the insensible figure, putting the paper in the breast. "'Is your hazard very great?' "'Mr. Carton,' the spy answered with a timid snap of his fingers, "'my hazard is not that, in the thick of business here, if you are true to the whole of your bargain. Don't fear me, I will be true to the death. You must be, Mr. Carton, if the tale of fifty-two is to be right.' Being made right by you in that dress I shall have no fear. Have no fear. I shall soon be out of the way of harming you, and the rest will soon be far from here, please God. Now get assistance and take me to the coach. You? asked the spy nervously. Him, man, with whom I have exchanged. You go out at the gate by which you brought me in? Of course. I was weak and faint when you brought me in, and I am fainter now you take me out. The parting interview has overpowered me. Such a thing has happened here, often and too often. Your life is in your own hands. Quick, call assistance. You swear not to betray me, said the trembling spy as he paused for a last moment. Man, man, returned Carton, stamping his foot. Have I sworn by no solemn vow already to go through with this, that you waste the precious moments now? Take him yourself to the courtyard you know of. Place him yourself in the carriage. Show him yourself to Mr. Lorry. Tell him yourself to give him no restorative but air, 
and to remember my words of last night and his promise of last night and drive away. The spy withdrew, and Carton seated himself at the table, resting his forehead on his hands. The spy returned immediately with two men. How then, said one of them, contemplating the fallen figure, so afflicted to find that his friend has drawn a prize in the lottery of St. Guillotine? A good patriot, said the other, could hardly have been more afflicted if the aristocrat had drawn a blank. They raised the unconscious figure, placed it on a litter they had brought to the door, and bent to carry it away. The time is short, Evremond, said the spy in a warning voice. I know it well, answered Carton. Be careful of my friend, I entreat you, and leave me. Come then, my children, said Barsad, lift him and come away. The door closed, and Carton was left alone. Straining his powers of listening to the utmost, he listened for any sound that might denote suspicion or alarm. There was none. Keys turned, doors clashed, footsteps passed along distant passages. No cry was raised or hurry made that seemed unusual. Breathing more freely in a little while, he sat down at the table and listened again until the clock struck two. Sounds that he was not afraid of, for he divined their meaning, then began to be audible. Several doors were opened in succession, and finally his own. A jailer with a list in his hand looked in, merely saying, "'Follow me, Evremond,' and he followed into a large dark room at a distance. It was a dark winter day, and what with the shadows within, and what with the shadows without, he could but dimly discern the others who were brought there to have their arms bound. Some were standing, some seated. Some were lamenting and in restless motion, but these were few. The great majority were silent and still, looking fixedly at the ground. As he stood by the wall in a dim corner, while some of the fifty-two were brought in after him, one man stopped in passing to embrace him as having a knowledge of him. It thrilled him with a great dread of discovery, but the man went on. A very few moments after that a young woman, with a slight girlish form, a sweet spare face in which there was no vestige of color and large widely opened patient eyes, rose from the seat where he had observed her sitting and came to speak to him. "'Citizen Evremond,' she said, touching him with her cold hand, "'I am a poor little seamstress who was with you in La Force.' He murmured for answer, "'True, I forget what you were accused of. Plots. Though the just heaven knows that I am innocent of any, is it likely? Who would think of plotting with a poor little weak creature like me?' The forlorn smile with which she said it so touched him that tears started from his eyes. I am not afraid to die, citizen Evremond, but I have done nothing. I am not unwilling to die if the Republic which is to do so much good to us poor will profit by my death. But I do not know how that can be, citizen Evremond. Such a poor little weak creature. As the last thing on earth that his heart was to warm and soften to, it warmed and softened to this pitiable girl. I heard you were released, citizen Evremond. I hoped it was true. It was but I was taken again and condemned. If I may ride with you, citizen Evremond, will you let me hold your hand? I am not afraid, but I am little and weak, and it will give me more courage. As the patient eyes were lifted to his face, he saw a sudden doubt in them, and then astonishment. He pressed the work-worn, hunger-worn young fingers and touched his lips. Are you dying for him? she whispered. And his wife and child. Hush, yes. Oh, you will let me hold your brave hand, stranger? Hush, yes, my poor sister, to the last. The same shadows that are falling on the prison are falling in that same hour of the early afternoon, on the barrier with the crowd about it, when a coach going out of Paris drives up to be examined. Who goes here? Whom have we within? Papers! The papers are handed out and read. Alexander Manette, physician, French. Which is he? This is he. This helpless, inarticulately murmuring, wandering old man pointed out. Apparently the citizen doctor is not in his right mind. The revolution fever will have been too much for him. Greatly too much for him. Ha! Many suffer with it. Lucie, his daughter. French. Which is she? This is she. Apparently it must be. Lucie, the wife of Evremond. Is it not? It is. Ha! Evremond has an assignation elsewhere. Lucie, her child. English. This is she? She and no other. Kiss me, child of Evremond. Now thou hast kissed a good Republican, something new in thy family, remember it. Sidney Carton. Advocate. English. Which is he? He lies here, in this corner of the carriage. He, too, is pointed out. Apparently the English advocate is in a swoon. It is hoped he will recover in the fresher air. 
It is represented that he is not in strong health, and has separated sadly from a friend who is under the displeasure of the Republic. Is that all? It is not a great deal, that. Many are under the displeasure of the Republic, and must look out at the little window. Jarvis Lorry, banker, English. Which is he? I am he, necessarily being the last. It is Jarvis Lorry who has replied to all the previous questions. It is Jarvis Lorry who has alighted and stands with his hand on the coach door, replying to a group of officials. They leisurely walk round the carriage and leisurely mount the box, to look at what little luggage it carries on the roof. The country people hanging about press nearer to the coach doors and greedily stare in. A little child carried by its mother has its short arm held out for it, that it may touch the wife of an aristocrat who has gone to the guillotine. Behold your papers, Jarvis Lorry, countersigned. One can depart, citizen? one can depart. Forward, my postilions, a good journey. I salute you, citizens, and the first danger past. These are again the words of Jarvis Lorry as he clasps his hands and looks upward. There is terror in the carriage, there is weeping, there is the heavy breathing of the insensible traveller. Are we not going too slowly? Can they not be induced to go faster? asks Lucy, clinging to the old man. It would seem like flight, my darling. I must not urge them too much. It would rouse suspicion. Look back, look back, and see if we are pursued. The road is clear, my dearest. So far we are not pursued. Houses in twos and threes pass by us. Solitary farms, ruinous buildings, dye-works, tanneries, and the like. Open countries, avenues of leafless trees. The hard, uneven pavement is under us. The soft, deep mud is on either side. Sometimes we strike into the skirting mud to avoid the stones that clatter and shake us. Sometimes we stick in ruts and sloughs there. The agony of our impatience is then so great that in our wild alarm and hurry we are forgetting out and running, hiding, doing anything but stopping. Out of the open country, in again amongst ruinous buildings, solitary farms, dye-works, tanneries and the like, cottages in twos and threes, avenues of leafless trees. Have these men deceived us and taken us back by another road? Is this not the same place twice over? Thank heaven, no. A village! Look back, look back, and see if we are pursued. Hush, the posting-house. Leisurely our four horses are taken out. Leisurely the coach stands in the little street, bereft of horses, and with no likelihood upon it of ever moving again. Leisurely the new horses come into visible existence one by one. Leisurely the new postilions follow, sucking and plating the lashes of their whips. Leisurely the old postilions count their money, make wrong additions, and arrive at dissatisfied results. All the time our overfraught hearts are beating at a rate that would far outstrip the fastest gallop of the fastest horses ever foaled. At length the new postilions are in their saddles, and the old are left behind. We are through the village, up the hill and down the hill, and on the low watery grounds. Suddenly the postilions exchange speech with animated gesticulation, and the horses are pulled up almost on their haunches. We are pursued? Ho! Oh, within the carriage there! Speak, then! "'What is it?' asks Mr. Lorry, looking at the window. "'How many did they say?' "'I do not understand you. "'At the last post, how many to the guillotine to-day?' Fifty-two. "'I said so, a brave number. "'My fellow citizens here would have it forty-two. Ten more heads are worth having. "'The guillotine goes handsomely. I love it. "'High forward. Whoop!' "'The night comes on dark. He moves more. "'He is beginning to revive and to speak intelligibly. He thinks they are still together. He asks him by his name what he has in his hand. Oh, pity us, kind heaven, and help us. Look out, look out, and see if we are pursued. The wind is rushing after us, and the clouds are flying after us, and the moon is plunging after us, and the whole wild night is in pursuit of us. So far we are pursued by nothing else. End of Book 3 Chapter 13 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Moira Fogarty. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Three, Chapter Fourteen The Knitting Done. In that same juncture of time when the fifty two awaited their fate, Madame Defarge held darkly ominous counsel with the Vengeance, and Jacques III of the Revolutionary Jury. 
Not in the wine-shop did Madame Defarge confer with these ministers, but in the shed of the wood-sawyer, erst a mender of roads. The sawyer himself did not participate in the conference, but abided at a little distance, like an outer satellite who was not to speak until required, or to offer an opinion until invited. "'But our Defarge,' said Jacques Three, "'is undoubtedly a good Republican, eh?' "'There's no better,' the voluble vengeance protested in her shrill notes, "'in France.' "'Peace, little vengeance,' said Madame Defarge, laying her hand with a slight frown on her lieutenant's lips. "'Hear me speak. My husband, fellow-citizen, is a good Republican and a bold man. He has deserved well of the Republic, and possesses its confidence. But my husband has his weaknesses, and he is so weak as to relent towards this doctor.' "'It is a great pity,' croaked Jacques Three, dubiously shaking his head, with his cruel fingers at his hungry mouth. "'It is not quite like a good citizen. It is a thing to regret.' "'See you,' said Madame. "'I care nothing for this doctor, I. He may wear his head or lose it for any interest I have in him. It is all one to me. But the Evremond people are to be exterminated, and the wife and child must follow the husband and father.' "'She has a fine head for it,' croaked Jacques Three. "'I have seen blue eyes and golden hair there, "'and they looked charming when Samson held them up.' "'Ogre that he was, he spoke like an epicure. "'Madame Defarge cast down her eyes and reflected a little. "'The child also,' observed Jacques Three, "'with a meditative enjoyment of his words, "'has golden hair and blue eyes, "'and we seldom have a child there. "'It is a pretty sight.' "'In a word,' said Madame Defarge, "'coming out of her short abstraction, "'I cannot trust my husband in this matter. "'Not only do I feel, since last night, "'that I dare not confide to him the details of my projects, but also I feel that if I delay, there is danger of his giving warning, and then they might escape. "'That must never be!' croaked Jacques Three. "'No one must escape. We have not half enough as it is. We ought to have six score a day.' "'In a word,' Madame Defarge went on, "'my husband has not my reason for pursuing this family to annihilation, and I have not his reason for regarding this doctor with any sensibility.' I must act for myself, therefore. Come hither, little citizen." The wood-sawyer, who held her in the respect, and himself in the submission of mortal fear, advanced with his hand to his red cap. "'Touching those signals, little citizen,' said Madame Defarge sternly, "'that she made to the prisoners. You are ready to bear witness to them this very day?' "'Aye, aye, why not?' cried the sawyer. "'Every day, in all the weathers, from two to four, always signalling, sometimes with a little one, sometimes without. I know what I know. I have seen with my eyes.' He made all manner of gestures while he spoke, as if in incidental imitation of some few of the great diversity of signals that he had never seen. "'Clearly plots,' said Jacques Three. "'Transparently!' "'There is no doubt of the jury,' inquired Madame Defarge, letting her eyes turn to him with a gloomy smile. "'Rely upon the patriotic jury, dear citizeness. I answer for my fellow jurymen.' "'Now let me see,' said Madame Defarge, pondering again. "'Yet once more. Can I spare this doctor to my husband? I have no feeling either way. Can I spare him?' "'He would count as one head.' observed Jacques Three in a low voice. We really have not heads enough. It would be a pity, I think. He was signalling with her when I saw her, argued Madame Defarge. I cannot speak of one without the other, and I must not be silent, and trust the case wholly to him, this little citizen here, for I am not a bad witness. The Vengeance and Jacques Three vied with each other in their fervent protestations that she was the most admirable and marvellous of witnesses. The little citizen, not to be outdone, declared her to be a celestial witness. "'He must take his chance,' said Madame Defarge. "'No, I cannot spare him. You are engaged at three o'clock. You are going to see the batch of to-day executed. You?' The question was addressed to the wood-sawyer, who hurriedly replied in the affirmative, seizing the occasion to add that he was the most ardent of Republicans, 
and that he would be in effect the most desolate of Republicans if anything prevented him from enjoying the pleasure of smoking his afternoon pipe in the contemplation of the droll national barber. He was so very demonstrative herein that he might have been suspected, perhaps was, by the dark eyes that looked contemptuously at him out of Madame Defarge's head, of having his small individual fears for his own personal safety every hour in the day. I, said Madame, am equally engaged at the same place. After it is over, say at eight to-night, come you to me in St. Antoine, and we will give information against these people at my section. The wood-sawyer said he would be proud and flattered to attend the citizeness. The citizeness, looking at him, he became embarrassed, evaded her glance as a small dog would have done, retreated among his wood, and hid his confusion over the handle of his saw. Madame Defarge beckoned the juryman and the vengeance a little nearer to the door, and there expounded her further views to them thus. She will now be at home, awaiting the moment of his death. She will be mourning and grieving. She will be in a state of mind to impeach the justice of the Republic. She will be full of sympathy with its enemies. I will go to her. "'What an admirable woman! What an adorable woman!' exclaimed Jacques Three, rapturously. "'Ah, my cherished!' cried the vengeance, and embraced her. "'Take you my knitting,' said Madame Defarge, placing it in her lieutenant's hands, "'and have it ready for me in my usual seat. Keep me my usual chair. Go you there straight, for there will probably be a greater concourse than usual to-day.' "'I willingly obey the orders of my chief,' said the vengeance with alacrity, and kissing her cheek. "'You will not be late.' "'I shall be there before the commencement.' "'And before the tumbrils arrive. Be sure you are there, my soul,' said the vengeance, calling after her, for she had already turned into the street. "'Before the tumbrils arrive!' Madame Defarge slightly waved her hand to imply that she heard, and might be relied upon to arrive in good time and so went through the mud and round the corner of the prison wall. The vengeance and the juryman, looking after her as she walked away, were highly appreciative of her fine figure and her superb moral endowments. There were many women at that time, upon whom the time laid a dreadfully disfiguring hand. But there was not one among them more to be dreaded than this ruthless woman, now taking her way along the streets. Of a strong and fearless character, of shrewd sense and readiness, of great determination, of that kind of beauty which not only seems to impart to its possessor firmness and animosity, but to strike into others an instinctive recognition of those qualities, the troubled time would have heaved her up under any circumstances. But, imbued from her childhood with a brooding sense of wrong, and an inveterate hatred of a class, opportunity had developed her into a tigress. She was absolutely without pity. If she had ever had the virtue in her, it had quite gone out of her. It was nothing to her that an innocent man was to die for the sins of his forefathers. She saw not him, but them. It was nothing to her that his wife was to be made a widow, and his daughter an orphan. That was insufficient punishment, because they were her natural enemies and her prey, and as such had no right to live. To appeal to her was made hopeless by her having no sense of pity, even for herself. If she had been laid low in the streets, in any of the many encounters in which she had been engaged, she would not have pitied herself, nor, if she had been ordered to the axe to-morrow, would she have gone to it with any softer feeling than a fierce desire to change places with the man who sent her there. Such a heart Madame Defarge carried under her rough robe. Carelessly worn, it was becoming robe enough, in a certain weird way, and her dark hair looked rich under her coarse red cap. Lying hidden in her bosom was a loaded pistol. Lying hidden at her waist was a sharpened dagger. Thus accoutred, and walking with the confident tread of such a character, and with the supple freedom of a woman who had habitually walked in her girlhood, barefoot and bare-legged, on the brown sea-sand, Madame Defarge took her way along the streets. Now, when the journey of the travelling coach, at that very moment waiting for the completion of its load, had been planned out last night, the difficulty of taking Miss Pross in it had much engaged Mr. Lorry's attention. It was not merely desirable to avoid overloading the coach, but it was of the highest importance that the time occupied in examining it and its passengers should be reduced to the utmost. 
since their escape might depend on the saving of only a few seconds here and there. Finally he had proposed, after anxious consideration, that Miss Pross and Jerry, who were at liberty to leave the city, should leave it at three o'clock in the lightest wheeled conveyance known to that period. Unencumbered with luggage, they would soon overtake the coach, and, passing it and preceding it on the road, would order its horses in advance, and greatly facilitate its progress during the precious hours of the night, when delay was the most to be dreaded. Seeing in this arrangement the hope of rendering real service in that pressing emergency, Miss Pross hailed it with joy. She and Jerry had beheld the coach start, had known who it was that Solomon brought, had passed some ten minutes in torches of suspense, and were now concluding their arrangements to follow the coach, even as Madame Defarge, taking her way through the streets, now drew nearer and nearer to the else deserted lodging in which they held their consultation. "'Now what do you think, Mr. Cruncher?' said Miss Pross, whose agitation was so great that she could hardly speak or stand or move or live. "'What do you think of our not starting from this courtyard? Uh, another carriage having already gone from here to-day, it, it might awaken suspicion.' "'My opinion, Miss,' returned Mr. Cruncher, "'is as you're right. Likewise what I'll stand by you, right or wrong.' "'I'm so distracted with fear and hope for our precious creatures,' said Miss Pross, wildly crying, "'that I am incapable of forming any plan. Are, are you capable of forming any plan, my dear good Mr. Cruncher?' "'Respectin' a future spear o' life, miss,' returned Mr. Cruncher, "'I hope so. Respectin' any present use of this here blessed old head o' mine, I think not. Would you do me the favour, miss, to take notice o' two promises and wows what it was my wishes for to record in this here crisis?' "'Oh, for gracious sake!' cried Miss Pross, still wildly crying. "'Record them at once, and get them out of the way like an excellent man.' First, said Mr. Cruncher, who was all in a tremble, and who spoke with an ashy and solemn visage, "'Them poor things well out of this. Never no more will I do it. Never no more.' "'I am quite sure, Mr. Cruncher,' returned Miss Pross, "'that you never will do it again, whatever it is, and I beg you not to think it necessary to mention more particularly what it is.' "'No, Miss,' returned Jerry. "'It shall not be named to you. Second. Them poor things well out o' this, and never no more will I interfere with Mrs. Cruncher's flopping, never no more. Whatever housekeeping arrangement that may be, said Miss Pross, striving to dry her eyes and compose herself, I have no doubt it is best that Mrs. Cruncher should have it entirely under her own superintendence. Oh, my poor darlings! I go so far as to say, Miss, moreover, proceeded Mr. Cruncher, with a most alarming tendency to hold forth as from a pulpit, and let my words be took down and took to Mrs. Cruncher through yourself, that what my opinions respecting floppin has undergone a change, and that what I only hope with all my heart, as Mrs. Cruncher may be a floppin at the present time. There, 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 I hope she is, my dear man, cried the distracted Miss Pross, and I hope she finds it answering her expectations. Forbid it, proceeded Mr. Cruncher, with additional solemnity, additional slowness, and additional tendency to hold forth and hold out, as anything what I have ever said or done should be visited on my earnest wishes for them poor creatures now. Forbid it as we shouldn't all flop, if it was anyways convenient, to get em out of this here dismal risk. Forbid it, miss. What I say, forbid it. This was Mr. Cruncher's conclusion after a protracted but vain endeavour to find a better one. And still Madame Defarge, pursuing her way along the streets, came nearer and nearer. "'If we ever get back to our native land,' said Miss Pross, "'you may rely upon my telling Mrs. Cruncher as much as I may be able to remember and understand of what you have so impressively said. And at all events you may be sure that I shall bear witness to your being thoroughly in earnest at this dreadful time.' Now, pray let us think, my esteemed Mr. Cruncher, let us think. Still Madame Defarge, pursuing her way along the streets, came nearer and nearer. If you were to go before, said Miss Pross, and stop the vehicle and horses from coming here, and were to wait somewhere for me, w wouldn't that be best? Mr. Cruncher thought it might be best. Where could you wait for me? asked Miss Pross. Mr. Cruncher was so bewildered that he could think of no locality but Temple Bar. Alas! 
Temple Bar was hundreds of miles away, and Madame Defarge was drawing very near indeed. "'By the cathedral door,' said Miss Pross, "'would it be much out of the way to take me in near the great cathedral door between the two towers?' "'No, miss,' answered Mr. Cruncher. "'Then, like the best of men,' said Miss Pross, "'go to the posting-house straight and make that change.' "'I am doubtful,' said Mr. Cruncher, hesitating and shaking his head, "'about leaving of you, you see. We don't know what may happen.' "'Heaven knows we don't,' returned Miss Pross. "'But have no fear for me. Take me in at the cathedral, at three o'clock, or as near it as you can, and I am sure it will be better than our going from here. I feel certain of it. There, bless you, Mr. Cruncher. Think not of me, but of the lives that may depend on both of us.' This exordium, and Miss Pross's two hands in quite agonized entreaty clasping his, decided Mr. Cruncher. With an encouraging nod or two, he immediately went out to alter the arrangements, and left her by herself to follow as she had proposed. The having originated a precaution, which was already in course of execution, was a great relief to Miss Pross. The necessity of composing her appearance so that it should attract no special notice in the streets was another relief. She looked at her watch, and it was twenty minutes past two. She had no time to lose, but must get ready at once. Afraid, in her extreme perturbation, of the loneliness of the deserted rooms, and of half-imagined faces peeping from behind every open door in them, Miss Pross got a basin of cold water, and began laving her eyes, which were swollen and red. Haunted by her feverish apprehensions, she could not bear to have her sight obscured for a minute at a time by the dripping water but constantly paused and looked round to see that there was no one watching her. In one of those pauses she recoiled and cried out, for she saw a figure standing in the room. The basin fell to the ground, broken, and the water flowed to the feet of Madame Defarge. By strange, stern ways, and through much staining blood, those feet had come to meet that water. Madame Defarge looked coldly at her, and said, the wife of Evremonde? Where is she? It flashed upon Miss Pross's mind that the doors were all standing open, and would suggest the flight. Her first act was to shut them. There were four in the room, and she shut them all. She then placed herself before the door of the chamber which Lucy had occupied. Madame Defarge's dark eyes followed her through this rapid movement, and rested on her when it was finished. Miss Pross had nothing beautiful about her. Years had not tamed the wildness, or softened the grimness of her appearance. But she too was a determined woman in her different way, and she measured Madame Defarge with her eyes every inch. "'You might, from your appearance, be the wife of Lucifer,' said Miss Pross in her breathing. "'Nevertheless, you shall not get the better of me. I am an Englishwoman.' Madame Defarge looked at her scornfully but still with something of Miss Pross's own perception that they too were at bay. She saw a tight, hard, wiry woman before her, as Mr. Lorry had seen in the same figure a woman with a strong hand in the years gone by. She knew full well that Miss Pross was the family's devoted friend. Miss Pross knew full well that Madame Defarge was the family's malevolent enemy. "'On my way yonder,' said Madame Defarge, with a slight movement of her hand towards the fatal spot, "'where they reserve my chair and my knitting for me, I am come to make my compliments to her in passing. I wish to see her.' "'I know that your intentions are evil,' said Miss Pross, "'and you may depend upon it. I'll hold my own against them.' Each spoke in her own language. Neither understood the other's words. Both were very watchful, and intent to deduce from look and manner what the unintelligible words meant. "'It will do her no good to keep herself concealed from me at this moment,' said Madame Defarge. "'Good patriots will know what that means. Let me see her. Go tell her that I wish to see her. Do you hear?' "'If those eyes of yours were bedwinches,' returned Miss Pross, "'and I was an English four-poster, they shouldn't lose a splinter of me.' "'No, you wicked foreign woman. I am your match.' Madame Defarge was not likely to follow these idiomatic remarks in detail, but she so far understood them as to perceive that she was set at naught. 
woman, imbecile, and pig-like, said Madame Defarge, frowning. I take no answer from you. I demand to see her. Either tell her that I demand to see her, or stand out of the way of the door and let me go to her. This with an angry explanatory wave of her right arm. I little thought, said Miss Pross, that I should ever want to understand your nonsensical language, but I would give all I have, except the clothes I wear, to know whether you suspect the truth or any part of it. Neither of them for a single moment released the other's eyes. Madame Defarge had not moved from the spot where she stood when Miss Pross first became aware of her, but she now advanced one step. I am a Briton, said Miss Pross. I am desperate. I don't care an English twopence for myself. I know that the longer I keep you here, the greater hope there is for my ladybird. I'll not leave a handful of that dark hair upon your head if you lay a finger on me." Thus Miss Pross, with a shake of her head and a flash of her eyes between every rapid sentence, and every rapid sentence a whole breath. Thus Miss Pross, who had never struck a blow in her life. But her courage was of that emotional nature that it brought the irrepressible tears into her eyes. This was a courage that Madame Defarge so little comprehended as to mistake for weakness. Ha ha! she laughed. You poor wretch! What are you worth? I address myself to that doctor. She then raised her voice and called out, Citizen doctor! Wife of Evremonde! Child of Evremonde! Any person but this miserable fool! Answer the citizeness Defarge. Perhaps the following silence, perhaps some latent disclosure in the expression of Miss Pross's face, perhaps a sudden misgiving apart from either suggestion, whispered to Madame Defarge that they were gone. Three of the doors she opened swiftly and looked in. Those rooms are all in disorder. There has been hurried packing. There are odds and ends upon the ground. There is no one in that room behind you. Let me look. Never, said Miss Pross, who understood the request as perfectly as Madame Defarge understood the answer. If they are not in that room, they are gone, and can be pursued and brought back, said Madame Defarge to herself. As long as you don't know whether they are in that room or not, you are uncertain what to do, said Miss Pross to herself, and you shall not know that if I can prevent your knowing it, and know that or not know that you shall not leave here while I can hold you. I have been in the streets from the first. Nothing has stopped me. I will tear you to pieces, but I will have you from that door," said Madame Defarge. We are alone at the top of a high house in a solitary courtyard. We are not likely to be heard, and I pray for bodily strength to keep you here, while every minute you are here is worth a hundred thousand guineas to my darling," said Miss Pross. Madame Defarge made at the door. Miss Pross, on the instinct of the moment, seized her round the waist in both her arms, and held her tight. It was in vain for Madame Defarge to struggle and to strike. Miss Pross, with the vigorous tenacity of love, always so much stronger than hate, clasped her tight, and even lifted her from the floor in the struggle that they had. The two hands of Madame Defarge buffeted and tore her face, but Miss Pross, with her head down, held her round the waist, and clung to her with more than the hold of a drowning woman. Soon Madame Defarge's hand ceased to strike, and felt at her encircled waist. "'It is under my arm,' said Miss Pross, in smothered tones. "'You shall not draw it. I am stronger than you. I bless heaven for it. I hold you till one or other of us faints or dies.' Madame Defarge's hands were at her bosom. Miss Pross looked up, saw what it was, struck at it, struck out a flash and a crash, and stood alone, blinded with smoke. All this was in a second. As the smoke cleared, leaving an awful stillness, it passed out on the air like the soul of the furious woman whose body lay lifeless on the ground. In the first fright and horror of her situation, Miss Pross passed the body as far from it as she could, and ran down the stairs to call for fruitless help. Happily she bethought herself of the consequences of what she did, in time to check herself and go back. It was dreadful to go in at the door again. But she did go in, and even went near it to get the bonnet and other things that she must wear. These she put on, out on the staircase, first shutting and locking the door and taking away the key. Then she sat down on the stairs a few moments to breathe and to cry, 
and then got up and hurried away. By good fortune she had a veil on her bonnet, or she could hardly have gone along the streets without being stopped. By good fortune, too, she was naturally so peculiar in appearance as not to show disfigurement like any other woman. She needed both advantages, for the marks of gripping fingers were deep in her face, and her hair was torn, and her dress, hastily composed with unsteady hands, was clutched and dragged a hundred ways. In crossing the bridge she dropped the door-key in the river. Arriving at the cathedral some few minutes before her escort, and waiting there, she thought, what if the key were already taken in a net? What if were identified? What if the door were opened and the remains discovered? What if she were stopped at the gate, sent to prison, and charged with murder? In the midst of these fluttering thoughts the escort appeared, took her in, and took her away. "'Is there any noise in the streets?' she asked him. "'The usual noises,' Mr. Cruncher replied, and looked surprised by the question and by her aspect. "'I don't hear you,' said Miss Pross. "'What do you say?' It was in vain for Mr. Cruncher to repeat what he had said. Miss Pross could not hear him. "'So I'll nod my head,' thought Mr. Cruncher, amazed. "'At all events she'll see that.' And she did. "'Is there any noise in the streets now?' asked Miss Pross again, presently. Again Mr. Cruncher nodded his head. "'I don't hear it.' "'Gone deaf in an hour?' said Mr. Cruncher, ruminating, with his mind much disturbed. "'What's come to her?' "'I feel,' said Miss Pross, "'as if there had been a flash and a crash, "'and that crash was the last thing I should ever hear in this life.' "'Blessed if she ain't in a queer condition,' said Mr. Cruncher, "'more and more disturbed. "'What can she have been a-taking to keep her courage up? "'Hark! There's the roll of them dreadful carts. "'You can hear that, Miss.' "'I can hear,' said Miss Pross, seeing that he spoke to her, and "'Nothing!' "'Oh, my good man, there was first a great crash, and then a great stillness, "'and that stillness seems to be fixed and unchangeable, "'never to be broken any more, as long as my life lasts.' "'If she don't hear the roll of those dreadful carts, "'now very nigh their journey's end,' said Mr. Cruncher, glancing over his shoulder, "'it's my opinion that indeed she never will hear anything else in this world.' "'And indeed she never did.' End of Book 3, Chapter 14, The Knitting Done Recorded in Toronto, Ontario, by Moira Fogarty, October 2006Recording by Michael Sirwa. Michael. Sirwa. S I R O I S. dot com. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book Three, Chapter Fifteen. The Footsteps Die Out Forever. Along the Paris streets, the death carts rumble, hollow and harsh. Six tumbrils carry the day's wine to La Guillotine. All the devouring and insatiate monsters imagined, since imagination could record itself, are fused in the one realization, guillotine. And yet there is not in France, with its rich variety of soil and climate, a blade, a leaf, a root, a sprig, a peppercorn, which will grow to maturity under conditions more certain than those that have produced this horror. Crush humanity out of shape once more, under similar hammers, and it will twist itself into the same tortured forms. Sow the same seed of rapacious license and oppression over again, and it will surely yield the same fruit according to its kind. Six tumbrils roll along the streets. Change these back again to what they were, thou powerful enchanter, time, and they shall be seen to be the carriages of absolute monarchs, the equipages of feudal nobles, the toilettes of flaring Jezebels, the churches that are not my father's house, but dens of thieves, the huts of millions of starving peasants. No, the great magician who majestically works out the appointed order of the Creator never reverses his transformations. If thou be changed into this shape by the will of God, say the seers to the enchanted in the wise Arabian stories, 
then remain so. But if thou wear this form through mere passing conjuration, then resume thy former aspect. Changeless and hopeless, the tumbrils roll along. As the sombre wheels of the six carts go round, they seem to plough up a long crooked furrow among the populace in the streets. Ridges of faces are thrown to this side and to that, and the ploughs go steadily onward. So used are the regular inhabitants of the houses to the spectacle that in many windows there are no people, and in some the occupation of the hands is not so much as suspended while the eyes survey the faces in the tumbrils. Here and there the inmate has visitors to see the sight, then he points his finger with something of the complacency of a curator or authorized exponent to this cart and to this, and seems to tell who sat here yesterday and who there the day before. Of the riders in the tumbrils some observe these things, and all things on their last roadside with an impassive stare, others with a lingering interest in the ways of life and men. Some, seated with drooping heads, are sunk in silent despair. Again, there are some so heedful of their looks that they cast upon the multitude such glances as they have seen in theatres and in pictures. Several close their eyes and think, or try to get their straying thoughts together. Only one, and he a miserable creature, of a crazed aspect, is so shattered and made drunk by horror that he sings and tries to dance— not one of the whole number appeals by look or gesture to the pity of the people. There is a guard of sundry horsemen riding abreast of the tumbrils, and faces are often turned up to some of them, and they are asked some question. It would seem to be always the same question, for it is always followed by a press of people towards the third cart. The horsemen abreast of that cart frequently point out one man in it with their swords. The leading curiosity is to know which is he. He stands at the back of the tumbril, with his head bent down, to converse with a mere girl who sits on the side of the cart and holds his hand. He has no curiosity or care for the scene about him, and always speaks to the girl. Here and there, in the long street of St. Honor, cries are raised against him. If they move him at all, it is only to a quiet smile, as he shakes his hair a little more loosely about his face. He cannot easily touch his face, his arms being bound. On the steps of a church, awaiting the coming up of the tumbrils, stands the spy and prison sheet. He looks into the first of them, not there. He looks into the second, not there. He already asks himself, Has he sacrificed me? When his face clears, as he looks into the third. Which is Evremond? says a man behind him. That, at the back there. With his hand in the girl's? Yes. The man cries, Down, Evremond, to the guillotine, all aristocrats. Down, Evremond. Hush, hush, the spy entreats him timidly. And why not, citizen? He is going to pay the forfeit. It will be paid in five minutes more. Let him be at peace. But the man continuing to exclaim, Down, Evremond, the face of Evremond is for a moment turned towards him. Evremond then sees the spy, and looks attentively at him, and goes his way. The clocks are on the stroke of three, and the furrow ploughed among the populace is turning round, to come on into the place of execution and end. The ridges, thrown to this side and to that, now crumble in, and close behind the last plough as it passes on for all are following to the guillotine. In front of it, seated in chairs as in a garden of public diversion, are a number of women busily knitting. On one of the foremost chairs stands the vengeance, looking about for her friend. "'Therese!' she cries in her shrill tones. "'Who has seen her? Therese Defarge!' "'She never missed before,' says a knitting woman of the sisterhood." "'No, nor will she miss now,' cries the vengeance petulantly. "'Therese!' "'Louder,' the woman recommends. "'Ay, louder, vengeance, much louder, and still she will scarcely hear thee. "'Louder yet, vengeance, with a little oath or so added, and yet it will hardly bring her. "'Send other women up and down to seek her, lingering somewhere, and yet—' 
Although the messengers have done dread deeds, it is questionable whether of their own wills they will go far enough to find her. "'Bad fortune!' cries the vengeance, stamping her foot in the chair. "'And here are the tumbrils, and Evremond will be dispatched in a wink, and she not here. See her knitting in my hand, and her empty chair ready for her. I cry with vexation and disappointment.' As the vengeance descends from her elevation to do it, the tumbrils begin to discharge their loads. The ministers of St. Guillotine are robed and ready. Crash! A head is held up, and the knitting women, who scarcely lifted their eyes to look at it a moment ago when it could think and speak, count one. The second tumbril empties and moves on. The third comes up. Crash! And the knitting women, never faltering or pausing in their work, count two. The supposed Evremond descends, and the seamstress is lifted out next after him. He has not relinquished her patient hand in getting out, but still holds it as he promised. He gently places her with her back to the crashing engine that constantly whirs up and falls, and she looks into his face and thanks him. But for you, dear stranger, I should not be so composed, for I am naturally a poor little thing, faint of heart nor should I have been able to raise my thoughts to him who was put to death, that we might have hope and comfort here to-day. I think you were sent to me by heaven. Or you to me, says Sidney Carton. Keep your eyes on me, dear child, and mind no other object. I mind nothing while I hold your hand. I shall mind nothing when I let it go, if they are rapid. They will be rapid, fear not. The two stand in the fast-thinning throng of victims, but they speak as if they were alone, eye to eye, voice to voice, hand to hand, heart to heart, these two children of the universal mother, else so wide apart and differing, have come together on the dark highway, to repair home together, and to rest in her bosom. Brave and generous friend, will you let me ask you one last question? I am very ignorant, and it troubles me just a little. Tell me what it is. I have a cousin, an only relative, and an orphan like myself, whom I love very dearly. She is five years younger than I, and she lives in a farmer's house in the south country. Poverty parted us, and she knows nothing of my fate, for I cannot write. And if I could, how should I tell her? It is better as it is. What I have been thinking as we came along— and and what I am still thinking now, as I look into your kind, strong face, which gives me so much support, is this. If the Republic really does good to the poor, and they come to be less hungry, and in all ways to suffer less, she may live a long time, she may even live to be old. What then, my gentle sister? Do you think, the uncomplaining eyes in which there is so much endurance, fill with tears, and the lips part a little more and tremble, that it will seem long to me while I wait for her in the better land, where I trust both you and I will be mercifully sheltered? It cannot be, my child. There is no time there, and no troubles there. You comfort me so much. I am so ignorant. Am I to kiss you now? Is the moment come? Yes. She kisses his lips. He kisses hers. They solemnly bless each other. The spare hand does not tremble as he releases it. Nothing worse than a sweet, bright constancy is in the patient face. She goes next before him. Is gone. The knitting women count twenty-two. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. The murmuring of many voices the upturning of many faces, the pressing on of many footsteps in the outskirts of the crowd, so that it swells forward in a mass, like one great heave of water, all flashes away. 23. They said of him, about the city that night, that it was the peacefulest man's face ever beheld there. Many added that he looked sublime and prophetic. One of the most remarkable sufferers, by the same acts, a woman, had asked at the foot of the same scaffold not long before to be allowed to write down the thoughts that were inspiring her. If he had given any utterance to his, and they were prophetic, they would have been these. 
Icy Barsad and Cly, Defarge, the Vengeance, the Juryman, the Judge, long ranks of the new oppressors who have risen on the destruction of the old, perishing by this retributive instrument, before it shall cease out of its present use. I see a beautiful city, and a brilliant people rising from this abyss, and in their struggles to be truly free, in their triumphs and defeats, through long years to come, I see the evil of this time, and of the previous time of which this is the natural birth, gradually making expiation for itself and wearing out. I see the lives for which I lay down my life, peaceful, useful, prosperous, and happy, in that England which I shall see no more. I see her with a child upon her bosom, who bears my name. I see her father, aged and bent, but otherwise restored, and faithful to all men in his healing office, and at peace. I see the good old man, so long their friend, in ten years' time, enriching them with all he has, and passing tranquilly to his reward. I see that I hold a sanctuary in their hearts, and in the hearts of their descendants, generations hence. I see her, an old woman, weeping for me on the anniversary of this day. I see her and her husband, their course done, lying side by side in their last earthly bed and I know that each was not more honored and held sacred in the other's soul than I was in the souls of both. I see that child who lay upon her bosom and who bore my name, a man, winning his way up in that path of life which once was mine. I see him winning it so well that my name is made illustrious there by the light of his. I see the blots I threw upon it faded away. I see him foremost of just judges and honored men, bringing a boy of my name, with a forehead that I know, and golden hair, to this place, then fair to look upon, with not a trace of this day's disfigurement. And I hear him tell the child my story, with a tender and a faltering voice. It is a far, far better thing that I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest that I go to than I have ever known. End of Book 3, Chapter 15 And the End of A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens